Thank you very much. Morning, friends. It's a privilege to be here this morning and to have an introductory like this. It still makes me feel smaller. And I was very grateful for this opportunity to come this morning to Phoenix. I remember when I first came to Phoenix, I was about 17 years old. It certainly has grown since that time. Out this morning where we come into Phoenix, we could hardly tell when we left Tucson and got to Phoenix. It's almost tied together. So many um, places have sprang up, places where we used to go out here and even run burrows on the desert. Now there's motels and 10 cent stores and so forth. And of course that makes me getting old. And then I sit down here by the side of my good brother here, Brother Valdez. And uh, I said, well, brother, we're talking. And I said, well, of course, I'm getting old. I said, I realize that my miles are building up. I said, wait till you get my age or something like that. <laughs> I, was, I was surprised to know that he's about 12 years older than me. <laughs> so I, then I felt lots better. <laughs> I said, brother Valdez, I want you. How long have you been preaching the gospel? He said, 50 years. Well, I was a very small child when he was preaching. <laughs> so uh, I said, I wish you would just take the service this morning, Brother Valdez. I said, I'm, uh, I'm a young man. I said, <laughs> he just kind of sat up here and tried to speak. And I said, my elders, <laughs> and uh, he was just like, said, what do you think I drove down here for? <laughs> so uh, I'm very grateful for Brother Valdez. He's telling me about having a rest home out here, and that's, that's really nice. I appreciate that. He invited me out to come and visit with him sometime. And um, it's out here by New River. I don't know where any of you know where it's at or not. I'm sure if a Valdez is behind it, it's all right. <laughs> so, and every time I come to a convention, I usually meet somebody that's, that's been healed in the services or something. And while I was standing here at the table this morning, a precious sister sitting over here, the name of Erd. She comes here from Michigan. Her son is the announcer here on this Christian station. And she was telling me about being in the meeting way back in Flint, Michigan. She got a prayer card and was trying to be prayed for. And she never did make it. And she's very seriously ill. And... Right here this morning, I believe God healed the woman standing right here by the side of the place. I said, what a time now. That's been about 12, 14 years ago. And now in the city called Phoenix, Phoenix is something that's built, built up from ruins. I said, well, that same thing happened to you this morning. God built you up, I believe, this morning from a, a ruined uh, health to good health. But just hearing last evening, the calls was coming so many. I'm your neighbor now. I live in Tucson. And um, the calls were so many, I couldn't get out to get them all. So I just prayed for them by phone. And they, then they just had to leave their numbers. And there was a lady, 87 years old, an old Christian. She had uh, been out of her mind for a while. She was in the street screaming and calling the police that somebody had taken her baby at 87 years old. See, her mind had left her. And she was a dear old woman. I never knew her in my life. And so Billy rang and said, go immediately to prayer. I said, the, the lady is seriously, and they think she's going to die. I said, she's just, she's beyond herself. Then I just hung up the receiver and went into the room and prayed. In a few moments, she was asleep. She woke up normally well eat a full chicken supper with all the ice cream and cake behind it you see God is sovereign he's so real he can you don't have to be there just just ask this I believe our leader here this morning or someone or maybe it's brother Valdez in his prayer said we have not because we ask not we ask not because we believe not I appreciate the singing of this young people here Brother Valdez, the old people were remarking of the sincerity of that young man making that testimony that he knew Jesus. 
Now we know that we find many times these little quartets and singings. Uh, I, uh, this is another minister's word, Brother Valdez says sometimes become a dime a dozen. Because it seems like today it's, a, it's become a show in the state of the, the sacredness and sincerity that the Pentecostals once possess. And um, the sincerity of these boys, I, I appreciated that. The Lord bless you boys. And um, I was, I'm not much on television, as you know, I'm really against it. And I'm really renting a place down in Tucson until we get our place fixed where we have our home established there, the Lord willing. And the lady that rents the house, she's a fine Christian friend. But she had in the house a, a, a television. Well, I've got young children, and you know how they are. So they are hurrying to it. So a couple mornings ago when I just come in from a trip with Brother Stromy, I don't know whether Brother Stromy is here this morning or not. He's the president of the chapter at Tucson. Um, my young daughter, which is sitting back over here, called me in to watch, them, said, we're going to turn the television on uh, some singing quartets or whatever it was. Well, I, I am a very good critic, and I, I'm sorry for that, but I, I, I can't be nothing but just what I'm made. If I do something contrary to my own makeup, I'm a hypocrite. And I, I wouldn't want to be that before you people. I, I want to be just what I am, and then you know how we're standing. And uh, I, I guess I criticize a little too much, but I just had it in my heart to criticize that. Because it just looked to me like some kind of a Hollywood put on, just a lot of carrying on. It didn't seem like the sacredness that should, and they sang those hymns and, and rock and roll time and gold slippers on. And uh, has it come that the gospel has become a show? Why, I, if that's what it is, I, I don't want nothing to do with it. I want something that's real and genuine. And we want to keep it that way. Now, uh, I believe that transposition is these two right here, brother. As, uh, do you hear me better now? Now, next Saturday morning, the Lord willing, I had the grand privilege of uh, speaking at the chapter uh, my first time at Flagstaff, Arizona. The brother here, I just forget his name, is the president. Chester Chester Earl, Brother Chester Earl, just had the opportunity this morning when I was just shaking hands with a fine evangelist here from India, uh, Indian brother. And uh, he uh, said that the next Saturday morning I'm to speak there. You're all cordially invited to attend this meeting. We hope that the Lord will bless it. And uh, then the following Monday night at Tucson is a banquet. The Lord has given me the honor to speak to the, at the banquet down there, 21st day of, of December at Tucson. You're certainly uh, cordially invited to attend that banquet night. And then this Brother Williams announced that I'm to be right here again for the county a little early before the convention starts. And um, so I, am I getting some static there, Brother Williams? There's something. Uh, I say, is that better now? That's better, fine. I certainly hope that many of you can find time to attend one or every night a day of the meeting that, uh, that starts on the 17th of Sunday afternoon. 1 30. 1 30. Sunday afternoon. I want to say also, if the Lord will, I'll be praying for the sick in, in, in those needs. And doing all I can to help you. And minister brothers here this morning of, of the Phoenix area, the reasons that I come here uh, to this uh, hall, I have, each time when I come, I usually make a little panoramic and run around to the churches, each church. Then I find it kind of hard because some of the churches are kind of small, and we certainly don't want to leave out any brother because his church is small. And then it makes it hard that people can't get in. So if I thought we'd just meet in one place and I'd take care of it myself and we'd just 
meet here and have a service, just a little evangelistic service and pray for the sick and things before, maybe if I get over on this other, is this better over here? No, that's the tape. That's the tape. Okay. Uh, maybe it would be a, a little better if I did it that way. And I want my brethren here, the, uh, the churches, the pastors here in Phoenix, to know that that's the reason we did this, to come here to this hall so we could have all get together in one certain place. And uh, you can't get to all the brethren, there's so many of them. You've seen what stood this morning, and probably that's not a half of them. So you can't get them all in a few days that we had here, uh, before or prior to the convention. And I'm sure we're going to have a great time in the convention. You'll hear great speakers. This brother, Cash, is, uh, Cash Hamburg, Hamburg, my, how many ever heard him? <laughs> He certainly is a, a typhoon. He, uh, uh, excuse me, I ought to have said it that way after brother, but, uh, but my, I was with him one time. <laughs> you know, I don't see how you ever come and hear me when you hear a fellow like that. He can preach and never catch his breath. I, I don't know how he does it. I, <laughs> but he certainly does get a lot out. I went with him in my New York convention recently, and he wanted to take me to, to supper after the meeting. And, I went into a place and I was about ready to get out. And he, he preached all up and down the floor and everywhere around. Everybody there was in there. He's quite a, a character in himself. And I'm sure you'll enjoy a brother from California too. Oh, uh, what's his name? I can't think of his name. Uh, the one, one of the speakers. I, I forget his name too. But he's a, a forceful speaker. And you will enjoy, and there'll probably be great speakers there, such as, uh, you know, the, the Brother Roberts and many of the great men uh, of this day. So I'm thankful to think about a scripture comes on my mind here at this time. At one time, David was looking out upon the ark of the Lord, setting in tents, and he said, he was sitting with the prophet. Nathan of that day. And so he said, Is it right that I would dwell here in a house, live in a house of cedar, in the ark of the covenant of my Lord under tent? And the prophet said to him, Do all that's in your heart, David, because God's with you. That's all he knew to say. But that night, the Lord met the prophet and said, Go tell my servant David that I took him from that sheep coat, from following those few sheep, you know, and have made him a name like the great man. Not the biggest name, not the greatest name, but numbered him with the great man that was in the earth at that time. And I thought the grace of God to David there, and I thought I could count it myself when I find the privilege of this day that we're living in the closing days of the world's history and to be numbered among uh, such men as we have attend these meetings. And the Lord bless you real richly. Now, um, my good friend, Brother Valdez, said, Brother Bram, I got to leave it at, uh, I'll leave it quarter to ten or quarter eight or ten, so I'm going to get over on the end so I won't disturb, disturb you speaking. Uh, he's been in the meetings before. I'm, I'm kind of slow and have to think, you know, when I'm speaking. And I write down my scriptures here, and a note maybe, but then I have to go back and think what the Lord told me to say, you know, I have to wait for him. And I'm kind of slow, so I hope I don't keep you too long this morning. I asked Brother Williams, I said, Brother Williams, how much time do I have? I said, now, I had a scripture here I could speak on, which would take you just about 30 minutes or something and dismiss everyone and go home. And uh, I said, but uh, I'd like to have a little lesson, if it's possible, and on what I think that would be something for you today, something that you could take home with you to think of it. And uh, I certainly wouldn't have got up this morning at 3.30 or 20 minutes to 4 and got ready to come up here just to be seen. I, I, I don't care to be seen. I, I come here and studied yesterday upon some scriptures that I got written down or something that I prayed sincerely over and thought maybe that through that it might help somebody. I, we haven't got time for shows and sceneries. We, we must... Get down to business. I believe Jesus is coming pretty soon. And now uh, they're taping this. And probably someone might get the tape. And I'd like to make this statement that 
sometimes I'm, many times I am really misunderstood. And uh, many times people call me back and say, Brother Brandon, was this the light you meant that in? And sometimes it's, we say something, but you have to know to approach it by terminology, the, the one I meant by it. And I uh, say things sometimes that's, it's a little contrary to maybe someone's belief. I want you to get that clear now. Someone what someone believes. But I have a, a message. I'm not from the Lord. And I feel that way about it. Others might feel it's from the devil. Others might feel it's nonsense. But to me, it's life. And uh, I don't mean to be different when I say things that's different or maybe a little hurty or cutty to people. I don't mean it in that light. I, I, if I do, then I'm a hypocrite. I say it in the light of progress to God. I say it in the light of, uh, of, of have uh, people to know God better. And I say it not because of, it's something I made up myself. It's something that I find from God. And now if I happen to speak on something in any of these conventions that hurts people or say, I don't believe that that way. Well, I've often made this rude statement and my wife sitting there listening to me. She knows it's not much formality about it. I, I, uh, just like when you're eating chicken and you run into a bone. I, no good chicken lover ever throws away the chicken because he hit a bone. <laughs> he just throws away the bone. <laughs> and he goes into eating chicken. The same thing in eating cherry pie. If I hit a seed, I, I, I never throw the pie away. I just throw the seed away. So, and uh, what I say here that might seem like in any of my meetings, it seems like a seed to you. Well, you just lay that aside and say, allow that to me not knowing as much about it as you would. So then you just go ahead and eat what you think is right. And I'll, I trust now that the Lord will bless his word. I am a firm believer in the Word and the Word only. Just the Word only. And that's the message that the Lord has given me. We differ one from another. I noticed this morning my brethren, missionaries, evangelists, and pastors standing here, maybe a maybe hundred or more of them standing here. Each one of them is more qualified to stand here and speak than I am. I'm sure of that. But... Uh, See, each one of us, one can't take the other one's place. One cannot take the other's message. See, we have our different ways. God's sovereign. When he, who, who could tell God how to make things in the beginning when it's just he alone? See, and if we have eternal life, there's only one form of eternal life, and that's God. So if we have eternal life, we were with God right then, a part of God. We were his attribute. We are now his attribute in a, because in the beginning was a word and a word is a thought expressed. So we were his thoughts then expressed into the word and become what we are. That's the reason our names, maybe not what we have now, but our names were put on the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. See, and if it wasn't there then, it'll never be there. See, and Jesus come to redeem all those that, whose names are on that book. See, he knows the potter, as Romans 8 tells us, uh, who can tell the potter, can the clay say, make me thus, thus? See, no, God has to display all of his attributes. And so he has to make one vessel of dishonor. And uh, the other to honor, to show that one up, of course. Now, but he's sovereign. You see, nobody can tell him what to do, and he makes us different. Even the, the, we're told in the Bible that the stars differ one from another. One star differs from another. You know, there's difference in heaven, in angels, angelic beings. There's angels, there's cherubims, there's seraphims, and they're, they're different there. And we're all different. And God has big mountains. He has plains, prairies, grass, desert, water. See, he's, he's different. He's, a, he's a, a God of variety. And look at these people here this morning. Some of us white, some black, some brown, some yellow, some red. See, it's, it's his people. He's a, he's, he's a God of variety. And so I think he has the same thing among his ministers. Now, let us bow our heads just a moment for prayer. And I might say this now before we read the word. I know that if I missed a little long and you have to get up and go out, I'll understand. See, I'll perfectly understand. Now, let us pray. And while we're praying, with our heads bowed towards the dust in which God took us, is there someone here would like to be remembered in prayer? Just raise your hand. He, he knows right what's in your heart beneath that hand. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we are solemnly approaching thee with our heads turned to the dust from where you have took us. And then in our minds, we're thinking that you told Abraham one night, could he number the sands that was upon the seashores? And then you told him to look towards the stars, and could he number them? Of course, it was impossible. And you told him that his seed would be innumerable as the sands on the seashore and on the stars that light the heavens. Then our minds are thought, uh, our thoughts in our minds, rather, as we bow our heads towards the sand where we come from, then our hearts look towards heaven where we're going, from sand to stars, being Abraham's seed. Dead in Christ, we are Abraham's seed and heirs with him according to the promise. And we have come here this morning to fellowship around the natural foods of life which we have taken to get that out of the way, and now we are desirous of thee to give us of that heavenly manna, that food that would give us uh, strength in the life that's in us, as the blood carries away this food now to strengthen it, to make more cells, to build us strong for the day, may we receive of Christ that he might get into our spirits this morning through the word and, and strengthen us for the hour that we're living in. Cause the day is far spent and the evening shadows are falling. The evening light is here and we are soon listening for the summons to come on high. And we're wanting to be ready at that hour. So help us, Father. And there's no man worthy to open the book or to loose the seals thereof. But the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, come tuck the book and loose the seals. Oh, Lamb of God, come this morning, open the book to us, and let us look in with thee, Lord, and see uh, what we must do to be prepared for this hour. Bless every church. Bless the, the oncoming meetings in each one of them. And our little uh, meeting to join with them uh, coming on. And when we leave here today, may we be able to say like those who came from Emmaus. Did not our hearts burn within us as he spake to us uh, by the way? Granted, Father, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now, to you that would like to turn, usually you like to read uh, from behind a minister when he's going to read to find out just where he's speaking from. If you have your Bibles, and we'll turn to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. And now I'm going to give my text just before I speak. I more or less want to teach it like and speak it as we go along. And this I have titled somehow, I don't know why, I'm titling this The Harvest Time. And we're going to take a scripture reading to base this thought upon, to draw from here the context of the text. We're going to read St. Matthew, the fourth chapter, a portion of it. This is in the temptations of Jesus. After he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was led into the wilderness. Now, when Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil... And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the devil taking him up into the holy city and set him upon a pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dashest thy foot against the stone. 
Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil taken him into exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glories of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I want to back up just a little bit to the fourth verse again. But he answered and said unto him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now for a subject, I would like to take that. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now hold that in thought while we speak. Jesus once said in St. John 6, 48, I believe that's right as I jotted down this morning, I am the bread of life. This is at the feast of the Passover. When the Jews were, were eating their kosher and commemoration of the manna that fell in the wilderness and And they were drinking from a fountain there, representing the rock that was in the wilderness. And they were having a great time. And Jesus cried right out in the midst and said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers eat manna in the wilderness for the space of 40 years. And they're every one dead. But I'm that bread that come from God out of heaven. If a man eat thereof, he'll not die. And for the rock, he said, I am that rock that was in the wilderness. I am that rock that your fathers drank from. How They said, you're a man not more than 50 years old and say that you've seen Abraham. Now we know that thou has a devil and are mad. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. I am was the pillar of fire that was in the bush that talked to Moses. And if you... Fix that out in his nouns and pronouns. Not I was, I will be, I am is present tense. All the time. Uh, We're thinking of this, that him saying himself now that I am that bread of life. Now how could this man be bread of life? That's what we want. My body is bread, he said. And now how could this man be bread? That's kind of strange, but don't be puzzled about it. Uh, People of his time got puzzled about it. They didn't know how that this man could actually be bread himself. Also, in St. John 1, it is given to us this way, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So, the Word became the bread. The Word and the bread here would have to be the same because Jesus is the Word and He is the bread. Now how could He be bread and Word? All the, It would be puzzling to the carnal mind. But we're hoping this morning that there's no carnal minds among us. That there is a spiritual mind among us. That we could understand what the Father is trying to get to us here. Seeing these words are puzzling, but at the same time they are scriptural truth. Now how could this man be bread? That's what they said. That's what I believe Josephus, many historians, uh, I've been studying it now. I'm writing a book, my commentary on the... Uh, first four chapters of Revelations. Hope to have it out pretty soon. It'll be a large book. And I have a brochure of each church age. Uh, studying church history, I, uh, kind of in my mind, I believe it was Josephus, that, or one of the early writers anyhow, that said that this Jesus of Nazareth, who went about healing the sick, said his disciples dug him up and eat his body. See? They were taking the communion. They thought that they dug his body up and has eaten his body, which we do eat the communion or take the communion in symbol form of his body, because he was the Word. Now, see, this is puzzling, 
And uh, the same time there's scriptures, and Jesus said, all scripture must be fulfilled. See? Now, we want to always cut our minds from anything contrary to that scripture. Don't never, never, any time leave that scripture for anything. Not one word of it. Stay exactly with that scripture. Now, God's got to ju judge the people someday. And if he's going to judge the people by a church, which church will it be? They say the Catholic church. So then, which Catholic church? See, because they are in difference with each other worse than they are with us. See? They differ one uh, uh, all the different forms of them, the uh, Roman and the Orthodox and the uh, Chufanite and all many different tribes of them. And they certainly at one another's throats. So which one of them Catholic churches? If he does it by the Protestant church, which Protestant church? Each one different from the other. But he's going to judge the world and he's got to have some standard to judge the world by. Or he'd be unjust to let us go now and, and live this life without a standard to be judged by. Who would be right? Or could you tell what was right? There has to be a standard. And he said in his Bible that he would judge the world by Jesus Christ. And we read here that Jesus is the Word. And Hebrews 13, 8 says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So therefore he will judge the the church by their attitude towards Christ, who is the Word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Not out of the mouth of man, not out of the seminary, not out of the, of the church, but out of the mouth of God. Man must live by that. And that alone, not man's interpretation, but God's own word. Well, you say it's a mistake here. If it is, God's responsible for it. He brought it to me. Okay? This is what I mistake right here. It's what he said. Now, if this is kind of puzzling and about a man being bread and being word, let's now go and search for this. Let's find out, because the scriptures are all true and they, they cannot be ever broken. Every scripture will be fulfilled, no matter how strange it seems, that it'll always be fulfilled. What if, if Brother Williams or, or some of the brethren here, our great-great-grandfather, both could rise on the scene this morning and say, well, uh, uh, show them television. And maybe someone prophesied back in that their day and said there'd be a time that, that you can hear a voice around the world. They'd say, well, let the poor old fellow along. He's lost his mind. And uh, there'll be a time that color will flow right through the air. It's here right now. And uh, they'll turn on a little button, and around the world you'll see people moving and things right on the screen. Well, they'd say the poor old fellow. See? But now we have it. Right in this room this morning, and I want to bring you conscious of that before we approach farther. That God is in this room. The author of this word is here. So it doesn't matter how you're dressed, or what degree you live in life, or what kind of a home you live in, or what type of car you drive, or how much education you've got. God looks at your heart. And He looks at my heart. And we're judged from our heart. Not even our words, our heart judges us. From the heart speaketh the mouth. If it isn't, it's hypocrisy. Now, in this room now, is coming human beings. Forms of human beings passing through here from all around the world. Voices singing is in this room right now. But you see, you are only limited in your senses to a certain facet of sight. But now you can take the crystal or the tube or whatever is in the television and turn it on and with a set that could deviate that almost ether, ether ways and deviate that to condense it into a channel and pick up those people, someone in Australia, South Africa, or where or India, or wherever it may be, you can stand here on a screen and see even the color of clothes that they got. The color of the trees that ever move they made. 
Just flip on the television, see if that isn't so. Then it's got to be somewhere hid from our eyes that same thing is passing through here now. It passed through here when Abraham heard God say, look up towards the stars. It was here when Elijah sat on Mount Carmel. It was here when Adam was here. But they've just now discovered it. And so is God here. And the angels. And someday it'll be just as much reality as television or anything else is. Because the Spirit will bring us into that immortal life. Then we'll understand. So then we are speaking from His Word. Now, that we're going to try God, God the great Creator. Let's try to speak on the form of nature. Pick Him up in nature first to bring it back to the Word. Now, nature runs just with the Word because God is a creator of nature. When you see the way nature works, uh, find out that that's the way that... That's my first Bible, was to find out how nature found God in nature. And wheat is a nature's product, bread, make bread out of which sustains the natural body. Nature holds many secrets. We, you know, that's my first time to find God was watching nature. I've seen there had to be something. And now I, I have no education, therefore I speak a lot by nature. And it is, I'm not trying to support ignorance, but I'm trying to say you don't even have to have an education to know God. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. When he came out of the wilderness, we're taught that he went in the wilderness at the age of nine. And he stayed there because his job was important. His father was a priest. And in that certain line of priesthood or denomination, Oh, his father said, now, John, you know you're to introduce the Messiah. You know that brother so here just makes perfectly the Messiah. So John had to get away from that. He gets in the wilderness to himself because it must be God's choosing, and not man's choosing at all, who would be the Messiah. So he went in there at the age of about nine years old. And you notice when he come out at the age of 30, his sermons wasn't as a theologian. He didn't use great swelling words, but it was all on nature. He said to them, a uh, church man of that day, he said, you generation of snakes. That's what he's seen in the wilderness, snakes. He hated snakes. They were poison. In their veins, they had deathly poison. And he pronounced this upon the church of that day. You bunch of poison snakes. Who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Don't begin to say we belong to this and we're the, uh, we're the Jesuits or we're the so-and-so or we belong to the Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian or whatever it is. Don't begin to say you have that because I tell you God's able these stones to ride children to Abraham. Right? And also the axe, that's what he used in the wilderness. It laid at the root of the tree and every tree that don't bring forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. See, he wouldn't cut a tree that was bringing fruit because he lived by the fruit of the tree. But the tree that didn't bring fruit. Oh, you could just take all the scripture so inspired that everything in there fits around Jesus Christ. And see, every tree that bringeth forth thy good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And um, so forth. You see, he, he used his message in the realm of nature. And we want to face that now, being that we found that he said, I'm the bread. And man shall live by every word, and I am the word. See? So we want to go back in nature. I notice a lot of times I have to do that. And nature runs on the same scale. You take the time, you watch all the birds congregate, leave and go out in the field and go to eat. Watch all the cattle when they're out scattered out in the field eating. Drop your line in, fish will bite. But when them cattle, them birds huddle up in the trees, them cattle get in the corner, you might as well take your line up. They won't bite because nature runs on the same scale. All of them, and so does the Word of God run in continuity. God always does everything He does on the same scale. He decided at the beginning when man lost his fellowship with Him, He would save him by the shed blood of an innocent one. And He's never changed His method. We tried to educate Him into it, denominate Him into it, and, and beg Him into it, beat Him into it, or shout Him into it. It still remains the same. 
The shed blood only is where God meets a believer. Not, we cannot make one world council of churches and everybody need it. It'll never work. It never did. It never will. That's the way I'm against that system. God's got a system. You've heard it said today, all the churches come together. It's going to be a world council of churches. And Jesus prayed for that. Well, we all might be one. Well, now you see, that's carnal-minded without knowing the Spirit. Jesus said that they might be one, Father, as you and I are one. Not for some man to be over something that never will work. One denomination wants to take over the other and one man over the other. But that you might be one with God like Christ and God was one. That's what the prayer is. That he was the word. And Jesus prayed that we might be the word. Reflecting it. That's his prayer to be answered. See how Satan scrupled it up in the carnal mind? But that wasn't Jesus' prayer at all, that we might all congregate together and all have a certain creed and so forth. Every time they do it, they go further and further from God. He wants us to be one with God, and God is the Word. Each individual in his heart must be that one with God. God, knowing that this, all these things work out like this, now, that's how we find God sometimes is to look at nature. Seasons. Rotating around proves God. That's where I first found it. How that there's the life comes up in the spring. It lives its life. Produces a seed. Dies and goes into the ground. Comes back in the resurrection. It just revolves around. We could spend hours on it. But now how different that is from like our missionary brother here in India. I find many over there around the world. They believe in reincarnation. That, they, they, that uh, you die here as a man and you come back as a bird or an animal. See, that doesn't speak with nature. Nature speaks that this same seed went to the ground, the same seed comes up again. See? The same Jesus went down is the same Jesus come back. Hallelujah. And this body, when it falls into the ground, it'll not come back a flower or something else. It'll come back a man or a woman. We see it in nature, how it does. It has to go through the cold winters and rot and so forth. But the life is preserved if there's any life in it. But if, there, if that seed hasn't been germatized, it'll never raise again. It can't raise. There's nothing in it to raise it. And if we just become a nominal Christian, there's two churches in the world, church natural, church spiritual. They're all called Christians. But the church natural cannot raise. It's doing its raising now in the world council, council churches. But the Christian rises to meet Christ because it's a bride. we go to meet Him. There's a difference in Him. Nature holds these secrets to us and we can see Him as we watch Him. And we see that Christianity speaks the truth of death, burial, and resurrection. If there is then a wheat bread that we know we all live by, and we know that there's only one way that we can ever live, is by taking dead substance into our body. You can't live no other way. A vegetarian met me not long ago and said, Brother Branham, I had a lot of confidence in you. I heard you say you eat bacon and eggs for breakfast. He said, how could a godly man eat a thing like that? You see, I said, well, what's wrong with it? All things are unclean, but it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. The Bible said, if thou be a good minister of Jesus Christ, thou shalt remind the brother of these things. See? All things are sanctified, nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, 1 Timothy 3. Now we find that that is true. So I said, I said well, you have to eat something dead too. Oh, no, sir. I said, if you live at all, you have to live by dead substance. If you eat bread, the wheat died. If you eat greens, it died. Whatever you do, even the milk, you drink the bacteria, you, have, you can only live by dead substance. And then if something had to die so we could live physically, how much more did something have to die so we could live eternally? Death it takes to do it. Bread. See, Jesus said, I am the bread, and it's a wheat bread, and he wasn't that kind of bread. So there must be two kinds of lives that's sustained by bread. It would lead us to that. There can't be, he, isn't, he wasn't wheat, and he wasn't word. He was flesh, so there must be two kinds of life. We know that we die, so we live physically, as it said. Jesus, the Word, bread, died so we can live eternally. He was the Word, bread. Now, notice, keep that in mind. Now, to prove Jesus' words to be true, 
We see in, this, in the nature how it goes. Now, let's go to the Scripture to find out again. Back up into the Scripture till we get to our main text. In the garden, God gave His first family the Word of God to live by every word of it. The first family that was put up here on the earth was given eternal life as long as they stayed with God's Word. That was His plan. I am God, He says, I change not. That's still His plan. It's never His plan for creed or organization or man-made rules that man shall live by. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, to go back in Genesis, which is the beginning, Genesis means the beginning, we find that God gave His family eternal life as long as they stayed in this Word and lived by this Word. But when they broke it, just one link in the chain of promises death struck them, which was a promise also. It's a chain. You're hanging over hell with it. That's the only thing that'll carry you through. When the believer becomes a make-believer and lives on one word that's contrary to this word, he cuts his fellowship with God. One wing broke. And remember, your faith in this word is like a chain. A chain is its strongest and its weakest link. That's right. It's the strongest that it, because that's all it'll hold. And if there's something in the word that's puzzling to you, something that you have heard different, that they said, be, oh, that was for the apostles. And them things was for days gone by. When the scripture said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't let that be a weakness. Fortify it and hold it and wrap your life into it because that's the only thing that will take you over the flames of hell. That's right. Well, this chain is broke with Adam and Eve, the first family. Now remember, they didn't break a sentence. They didn't break three words. One word. Man shall hang over hell by every word. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's where man's eternal destination is determined. But I hang by that chain or I hang by a creed. Or if his creed mixed into the chain, that's where the weak link is and you're gone. That's where the weak link was with Adam and with Eve. That weak link, surely, he said, God, but surely God said it. And if God said it, God meant it. And he also keeps his word by saying, the day you hear that day you die. The day you put into you anything else besides the unadulterated word of God into your soul, that's the day that you're separated from God. Uh, this is very strong. But just listen close. Now, notice, one word, one word of the first of the Bible, God said that one word separated man from his eternal life chain. That's like taking a man and you're hanging by his feet and he's got his hands in heaven and you cut him half in two. Break off a toe of whatever you're hanging on to, you're hanging on the very bottom part. And you break that chain anywhere, you're gone. Now, bear that in mind. Remember, the Bible said in the mouth of three witnesses, let every word be established. We'll get on that in a few minutes on the three temptations of Jesus. The three temptations of ministers today. Where they make the fall. Three temptations of the church, where they make their fall. Three temptations of an organization, where it makes its fall. And the three temptations of the individuals, and where they make their fall. Now, it all runs in threes. Like justification, sanctification, baptism, Holy Ghost, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Everything is perfected in three. Now notice, God in the beginning, the very first thing He gave His children to live by was His Word. Now, we find that is the truth. Then in the middle of the Bible, we hear Jesus come and say that man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then in Revelation 22, 18, Jesus himself speaking again said, I testify these things. If any man shall add one word to this, 
or take one word of this book out, his part will be taken from the book of life. Now see, it's not our good living that just something goes with it. It isn't our, our church loyalty that goes with it. But the main thing is staying with that word. Don't eat nothing else but that word. Stay with it. He is that word. Now, we want to watch close now. What is the difference in this bread of creation to live? Now, wheat is the bread of life. If it's a, not a high bread grain, it'll bury it and it'll come up again. It must be a good ripe grain. Defective grains won't rise. We all know that Brother Southman sitting here, a wheat raiser from Canada, knows that you don't put defective grains into the soil to expect a crop out of it because the beetle or the, or the bacteria, what it is, in the grain, eats it up, eats the life out of it first. Did you know that the very worms that will destroy you, that will eat up your body, is in them right now? Job said, though my skin worm destroys this body, put you in a coffin and seal it up airtight, still the worms that's in you will eat you up. You find meal and flour and stuff and set it up a little while, it gets a bug in it, seal it up. What is that bug's in there to begin with? It's there to start with. Now, this grain must be a good grain. It must be uh, uh, free from uh, fault, failures, and so forth in it. It must be a third bread grain. It can't be a hybrid green grain because when it comes up, you plant it again and your, your wheat is done because a hybrid grain won't grow again. It can't grow again. You take the life out of it when you hybrid it. And that's what's happened to the churches. They've been hybrid. To the world, and that's the reason that each revival coming on, and you can't have another revival behind it. Every organization that ever organized dies on the spot and never raises again. Because it organizes the world into its systems. Therefore, it never did. There's no history ever shows that any church that ever organized ever raised again. She died there. Why? You hybrid it. Don't put a bishop over it. Let the Holy Ghost stay over it. Okay? The Holy Ghost was sent to keep the weeds and things out. Not what the bishop thinks or the overseers or so forth. It takes the Holy Spirit to keep that church in its condition. He was that perfect word as we will see. Adam had his choice, the word and live or disbelieve one word and die. We have the same choice. Because we have to be, if God put Adam... On the word and the word only, then he puts us on a creed or any kind of a creed, then God's unjust in his judgment. It is becoming to his holiness or his sovereignty. But it is becoming to his sovereignty to see that he puts every man on the same base. And he's God and changes not. What God does first, he forever does the same thing. He never changes his, his program. Only thing he magnifies it. But he never changes it. The same thing continues on. Now, Adam had a choice. And if he held to the word, he lived. If he didn't hold to the word, he died. And we got the same thing. We stay with the word, we live. Man shall live by every word. But if we don't, we die. We spiritually die. Oh, we can still make noise, sure, kick around, holler and carry on, but that, that ain't, ain't living. That isn't living. I'm a missionary. I've heard heathens kick around and holler more than we could and profess to know gods and things like that. They're not living. They're dead while they are living. The Bible said so. Now we find that this choice is given to us. But he compromised to Satan's one word, then die. And if the beginning, which God in his grace and mercy could have bypassed all the sufferings that we've done... All these deaths of little babies and everything and the wars and uh, turtles and crucifixions and things that we've had. If he could have bypassed it, his sovereignty of his word would have permitted him to bypass it. He would have been unjust if he didn't bypass it then. 
Do you get it? He can't bypass it. He never bypassed it for Adam to begin with, and he won't bypass it for you or I to begin with. We must come to that thing, the word only. Let every man's word be a lie, and mine be true, he said. Now, we're just looking for what day we're living in, the harvest time. Then God, after Adam had fell, tried for the word, and fell, God continued in his creation to try to find a man who would live every word. He tried to find man. That is, live the word for his age. I see God scattered his word out because he he's, he's infinite. And he's, uh, he's omnipresent, omniscient. Therefore, he knows all things. He can't be present everywhere. By being omnipresent, knowing all things, then he can be present everywhere. Because that's why he predestinates us by foreknowledge. Not because he desired that this person should be saved and this and lost. But he knew who would be lost and who would be saved. See? Therefore, by his foreknowledge, he can predestinate. And he makes everything work to his glory. That's what his attributes are doing, displaying to his glory. One vessel of honor and one of dishonor. But it's God that maketh it. Not him that willeth or him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. See? No man can come to me, said Jesus, except my Father draws him. And all that the Father hath, past tense, given to me, will come to me. To the Word. How can the comic, let's say, were, or, or, they were foreordained to come. As many as received him to them give he the power to become sons of God. Because their names are on the book. He come to redeem what was on the book. In Revelations we find out when the seals was opened, there was a book in him that sat upon the throne. God had it in his right hand and it wasn't nothing. Nobody in heaven or in earth or anywhere was worthy to come take the book or even to look on it. John wept with great because the whole book of redemption was there. Is that the meeting the other night? That little assembly of God, brother and sister, sang that song. I wonder if John saw me when he saw all the nations gathered. Did he see me? Sure he did. If your name was on that book. And when John's name was on it too, and he wept because there was nobody that could touch it. And then one of the elders come and said, Weep not, John, for the line of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And John was looking around to find a, a line, and out from behind the curtains come a lamb. A lamb that had been slain since before the foundation of the world. Then he saw a bloody lamb come out. And he come and took the book out of the right hand of him and called everything what was on that book, it's a complete book of redemption. And this is it. The book of redemption. He redeemed all was in that book, not out of the book. Anything that had a beginning has an end. But if you've got eternal life, you never did begin and you cannot end because you're sons and daughters of God's attributes of His house and His word. You have no ending of life. If your name is on that book, the Lamb comes to redeem it. Not all that profess Christians. Not all to try to live good and holy. But those whose names were written on there. He redeemed that and that alone. Whose names were on the book. Now, we find out that um, Satan caused Adam to fall by that one word. And God continued on now in his creation to try to find one man who would live by every word. His first man failed. And this man would live his time, his age that he lived in. I see these different ages that God prophesied from the beginning, which would take place all down. That's where you could tell the end from the beginning is because he knew all things. He made all things, but Jesus Christ and for him and for his own pleasure. Notice closely now, don't miss this. What if Moses would have come bringing Noah's message? It wouldn't have worked. Couldn't. No. What if Jesus would have come bringing Moses' message? It wouldn't have worked. What if we come trying to bring the Methodist message, Baptist message, or the Pentecostal message? It wouldn't work. They were fine. Prove that in a minute by the word. They were all right in their age. That age is gone. We got to find out what the scripture says for today. This day. That's what man's to live by. 
For his age, he tried to find a man that would live the whole world. First thing he did, he tried Noah. Noah failed him. Got drunk. He failed. Moses, that great, mighty masterpiece of God, he tried him and he failed. He glorified himself and wasn't permitted to go into the promised land. Then come David, that he was going to reflect his, his, the great millennium in David. And he was going to show what his king was. And God swore by David he'd rise up, raise up his son to sit on his throne. And David was such a gallant man until he's a man after God's own heart. And David was doing good. He smote all the Philistines and tore down their altars and stayed with the word. And finally, a pretty woman upset him. And he broke the commandment. Lost the word. Committed adultery. See? A man after his own heart. See, still David failed. Moses failed. All the rest of them failed. But all their lives were just reflection of the one that was to come. In the book of Revelations, as I'm writing, one man who is translating or grammarizing my grammar support, I've got a, a good scholar to grammarize it, put the right nouns and pronouns together, which I don't know which is the difference between a noun and a pronoun, but, but he does, and he's putting them on. The only thing I know, God gives it to me, and I just write it down. They, and they, they have to put it so if it goes into schools and things, they, they know I can read it more in their way of understanding. And then the writer said to me, uh, the uh, grammar, the man's grammar writer said to me, he said, but Brother Branham, we find in the Pergus church age that Jesus said here, he that overcometh, I will give him the morning star. Give him the morning star. He said, now, how could he get the morning star when Jesus said himself that he is the morning star? See, all those seeds of Abraham are reflected by star. They different one from another, and we'll different one from another. And Jesus is that morning star, the brightest of all of them. But we find him in Revelation 1 with seven stars in his hand. He interprets that and says, these seven stars are the seven angels to the seven churches, or the seven church ages that's coming. Then he said, how could it be then if they got the morning star? I said, the stars that were in his hand were only the reflection stars from the morning star. See? For the messenger of that day has the word, and he is the word. He just had the potion for that day. And the people that's ready to come away from the world systems and world things and walk with him sees the reflection of the morning star to the messenger of that age, as he did through Noah and through Moses and so forth as he reflected the Old Testament. Finally, it all arrived to one, and so will it at the end of the church ages. It will all arrive back to Jesus. That he is the word. We as Christians are only reflecting him. The moon only reflects the sun in its absence. And the believer only reflects the Son of God in the absence of the Son of God. It's the light of the Bible, the scriptures being vindicated in our lives. The word that makes light and darkness. You are candles that sets upon a hill. That ain't the sun, it's a candle. The candle just takes the place of the sun. This shows a certain amount of light. We are God's children. We are sons and daughters of God. Only for the Spirit with potion. He had it without a potion. We are a star that's shining. All of us together make a light for the world. But He's the entire sun that reflects the light of every star. Hallelujah! I believe Him. God, help my unbelief. Finally, this perfect one arrived. Now, he arrived to be tempted at every point just like we are. The Bible said he was. He was tempted like Noah. He was tempted like Moses. He was tempted like all the rest of them. If we had time to break that down and show you, but we haven't, because I don't want to take too much of your time. But to break it down and show you, he was tempted in the same manner, Satan never changes his path. Neither does God. Just changes ages. But what Satan got him back there to the first family of God on earth. Here it is, brother, sister. Don't fail to get this. How did Satan get the first family? He couldn't break it no other way but to get that word broken. For they were fortified behind that word if he could only get one gap. That's why he's got every church in every age. 
You've got every believer. Just pull that gap out. Well, I, I believe the Bible's right, but I don't believe that. Oh, there you go. Too bad, but there you went. Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Now, closely confine this now. Now, he finally this one that would arrive and had to be tempted just exactly like the rest of them were tempted. Now, notice how striking Satan makes his ever attack just the same each time. Now, he tried to give him the natural bread just like he did Eve. If you will eat this, take this or something other, he's got it. And that's what he does to every organization. That's what he does to every individual. He tries to give you the natural things that you can look at. And it's taking away. Well, look at this great big church. Well, they've got so many millions in them. Our church is the biggest church in the city. Well, our, we have the mayor comes to our church. Oh, see all that. Our pastor has a, a degree of DD, LD, PhD. That, well, that, uh, well, he's bound to be a smart man. A Catholic priest can come around and cover him over any time with his degree. He's got 60 some odd books. He has to know as, bad, as much as you know the Bible. To get his degree to be a priest. So don't try to compare education. That's just like the world's always trying to compare. Don't compare with things of the world. Don't compare with churches. Compare with the Bible. That's what we're doing today. That's what's the matter with our Pentecostal churches. That's what's the matter with our quartets and singings and so forth as we have. We're trying to act like Hollywood. Hollywood glitters. The gospel glows. There's a lot of difference between a glitter and a glow. Hollywood glitters with clothes and rickies and rickettas and ricochets. But... God humbly glows in humility of the believer no matter how eager he is. He glows in humility. Not shines in Hollywood. Notice, he tried his old tactic on Jesus. Same thing he did to Moses. Same thing he did to the rest of them. He tried it. He'll try it on you. To get you except some great big something that looks shiny. It reminds me when I used to hunt coons. Raccoons. I get me a, a papa, my daddy used tobacco. I don't know where y'all ever know what them old tags that used to be on a twist of tobacco. I would take that and get me a log and bore a hole in it right around the creek where a coon had been running. And then I'd bore a hole in there and stick this tobacco tag there. And then drive me some nails angling in like this. And the coon's always reaching for something shiny. And so when the moon come up and he went along there, he looked back there, he pushed his hand in there to get it. He, he won't turn it loose. He's like some church member or something. Even he knows he's caught. He won't turn it loose. If I do, they'll put me out of the organization. That's just his death. That's all. all right. Notice. There. He holds on to it. He won't turn it loose. Now, Satan tried his same tactic on Jesus that he tried on the rest of us. He tried to make him eat something besides the promised bread word. Of course, Jesus said it. It's written, man shall not live by bread alone. See? He tried to make him obey him. Though it looked pretty good. Looked like he could feed himself, and he could have done it. You have, you can act any way you want to, too. You can take it or leave it, either one you want to. Now, if that coon had sense enough just to close his hand back, he could pull it out again. But he won't do it. He's holding himself there. And that's the way a lot of nominal Christians do, too. They don't want to hear nothing about it. They don't want to come to hear it. They want nothing about it. Go ahead and hold on to it, then. See? You'll find out what happened. Now, notice, they tried to make him eat something besides the bread of life that every man should live by. But Jesus stayed with the Father's Word. Oh, he didn't hit Eve then. He never hit Moses. He never hit any of the rest of them. He hit one was going to reflect every word. See, that's the reason he was the Word. But Jesus stayed with the Word. Refused his theological seminary doctrine. <laughs> yes, sir. His new life. His more experience. <laughs> he couldn't push it on Jesus like he pushed it off on Eve to show Oh, surely God. Oh, surely God would be in this if we could get together and make a whole world council. Surely God would be. He wants unity. He wants brotherhood with himself. Amen. Not with the world. Amen. Brotherhood with himself. Worship to himself. That's what he died for, that you'd worship him. As 
ever, if he can't get now, we find out that he failed Jesus once right back to him with thus saith the Lord. Hey, now when he sees that a believer, watch the believer come in these same categories now. Each one of you. When he sees he, you're going to stay with the Bible. Oh, I believe the Bible. I ain't joining no uh, creed thing. I'm going to stay with the Bible. And if, ever, if he can't get you to believe, uh, to, uh, to live the tr- real truth and to believe the Word, I want you to notice what he done to Jesus the second time. If he can't get you to say, I ain't going to join no creed. I ain't going to, I'm not born free. I'm going to stay with it. I'm going to do this. Uh, uh, see, join the church and come join and something like that. He can't get you to do that. Then... He'll do something else to you. Oh, brother, watch this. If he doesn't, then he'll send you off to his own seminary to be taught by his own theologians. <laughs> See? Where Satan is the interpreter. All the days of miracles is past. That people down there, I got, well, that's a bunch of heretics. They, they're not to He'll send you there. Oh, you may say, wait a minute, brother Branham, just a minute. Now, yeah, let's do wait just a minute, Steve. You say, now, don't you go, I hope we're supposed to, I hope we're supposed to. No, sir. No, sir. But Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, see, he will bring these things that I've taught to your memory, the word. And he'll also show you things to come. There's a real spirit-filled church now. Stays that the word reflects the word God on earth. See? He doesn't need any theologian because his word is of no private interpretation. He interprets his own word by vindicating it and proving it that it's the truth. When the Methodist church told you you couldn't see, receive the Holy Ghost like the old day of Pentecost, did you pay attention to it? Certainly not. You went right along and got the Holy Ghost anyhow. See? Because of uh, discussing the, the Trinity with a, a Baptist minister the other night, and I told him it was only terminology. And so we come to find out, he said, another little minister there from the seminary, he said, but Mr. Branham, you're trying to make people believe in apostolic religion. I said, sir, it's the only one there is. And he said, sir, where did you go to school at? I said, on my knees, my brother. Not to, see, that, that's where I got, not theology, but neology. I said, that, that's where I found him. And he said, Mr. Branham. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, like they got on the day of Pentecost, you trying to say that that's the day I said the Bible said, sir, that the, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I said that was Jesus Christ that come on the day of Pentecost. Oh yeah. No, same one. Yet a little while, I'll pray the Father, He'll send you another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. A little while, and the world won't see no more, me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I will be with you. Even in you. To the consummation. Into the world. I said, yeah. That's him come on day of Pentecost. Yes, sir. He came, lived in him. Notice, in the form of the person of the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Ghost. As we understand the Godhead. Now, notice. Satan didn't need his theology. And this man said to me. He said, Mr. Branham. He said, I'll give you to understand I'm a, from a certain school. And we're trained. I said, I hear your program all the time. He said, uh, uh, we're trained there. said, their baptism of the Holy Ghost is for the disciples only. I said, the Bible said there was 120 in the upper room. Yeah. Yeah. I said, now who's right? You're the word. <coughs> and I said, and then also, when Philip went out and preached to the Samaritans, Amen. and he baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ, but the Holy Ghost hadn't come upon them yet because Peter had the keys. So he sent up to Jerusalem and got Peter who come down and laid hands up on him. And the Holy Ghost came up on him. The Bible said, the Holy Ghost. Amen. I said that Peter, with a vision, with the key, went up to the house of Cornelius, Acts 10, 49. And while he yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. For they heard them speak in tongues and, and, and prophesy, magnifying God. Then said Peter, can we forbid water that these should not be baptized? See, that they receive the Holy Ghost like we did. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We find 30 years later, Paul passes to the upper coast of Ephesus, finds some Baptist people who's having a great revival. Great things are going on. They shout and praise the Lord. And Paul visited the church where about 20 people were attending. 
Uh, where Aquila, Priscilla, was attending a meeting where Apollos, a converted lawyer, proven by the Bible that Jesus was the Christ, and they had great joy and a great meeting. Paul passing by, he came by after he, the Lord delivered him out of prison for casting the spirit out of a uh, devil, out of a fortune teller. And then he come on up through there in the work of the Lord, and he went to hear the meeting. And he said, this man's a great man, all right, but said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? He believed you received it when you believe. But he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? He said, we know not where be any Holy Ghost. said, then to what was you baptized? That was the question. He said, we've been baptized. The same man baptized Jesus. John. We've been baptized at John's baptism. See? He said, John only baptized unto repentance, not for remission of sin. John, of course, the lamb hadn't been killed yet. He said, John baptized unto repentance, saying that you should believe on him that was to come. On Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul laid his hands upon them, and the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they prophesied and spoke in tongues. Thirty years later. Now I said, besides, do you believe the Bible? He said, certainly. I said, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when this is all noise abroad, and there's all shouting and praising God, they said, man and brother, what can we do to be saved? Peter said, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and unto your children, and to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Heavens and earth will pass away, but that word will never fail. You Pentecostals pay no attention to the Methodist, Baptists, or Presbyterians. You know that was for every generation. And you press into it. Certainly. Now just don't stop pressing right there. <laughs> just keep on pressing. See? That's where Methodists made their state. They pressed into sanctification, but stop. Luther's pressed into justification, stop. See, then it organizes, there it dies. That's the end of it. It's all of it. Watch. Now as we hurry up to, when the spirit of truth is come, he will teach you all things whatever taught you. Oh my. Bearing all remembrance to you, what I've said to you, bringing to you all the memories. And he will show you things to come. He will vindicate every word, confirming the word with signs from him. Everything that he promised, that God promised in the Bible, if you'll turn loose from every creed and everything else and hold on to the word, God is obligated to take care of his word. And so when they did this, the word vindicates itself. He don't need somebody to say, well, the days of miracles is past. Who's that man to tell me the days of miracles is past? When I was once a blind man. I once laid with the doctors, give me three minutes to live, and I'm a living today. How can they tell me any different? Once the lukewarm church member now filled with the Holy Ghost. God don't need any interpreter. The Spirit itself, which is the Word, interprets it to be the truth of a man will dare to stand out and take it. He's his own interpreter. Try him one time and find out if that isn't right. Don't pay what somebody else said. Do what God said. Do. Well, you say, I'll do this, but what about the other? Every word, one word breaks the chain. That's where the church has always failed. Right on that chain, they organize it, get the thing together, make a big denomination. These band get together, Holy Father so and so and Dr. Bishop so and so and what's the first thing you have? There you are. You die right there. We we'll prove it by nature and by the word, if the Lord willing in a few minutes. All right, bring it to remembers. He vindicates every word, and we live by it. Hallelujah. Live by it. Man shall live by every word. Every word vindicated. Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. Shall follow them that believe. Take a hold of it. God vindicates it. It's the truth. Where the seminaries and theologians inspired by Satan say, You can't trust it. That's for the apostles. The days is past. There's no such thing. That was only meant for the apostles to prove the gospel then. We have learned people today. They had better learn it then than we got now. Tell me any church that can come up with that, that Sanhedrin. <laughs> when their great, 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 great grandfathers had to be priests behind them. One crooked word in that, in that uh, scroll, or uh, had, well, they, they stoned them for it. They had to stay right exactly, but they missed seeing the real kernel of the word when it comes. The line. 
That's why they were condemned and called the workers of Satan. See, that don't reflect the Word of God. When a seminary student tells you the Holy Ghost is not for today and these things, all that divine healing stuff for some other day. See, it's not a reflection from God. It's a reflection from a, a creed. It's a reflecting from a doctrine. It's outside the Bible. Hebrews 13, 8 said, He's the same yesterday and forever. St. John 14, 12 said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Now, how are you going to take that word out of there? How are you going to add something to this place? You break the chain of life. Man lives by bread only. The bre- Eternally he lives by that bread. Physically he lives by this bread. There's the two bread. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you says amen to every word of God if that is the Holy Ghost. Now I want to ask you something. Now this is the pension part. Mama used to give me castor oil when I was a kid. Now I can't stand the smell of this stuff yet. We was raised poor and Mama borrow meat skins or render them out. We get them down to, uh, from a, an old sister named Goodman that had a bakery down there. She baked hands and things and render that out. We get meal and take that grease and stuff and make our cornbread. And we had poor eating. No wonder we had malnutrition and so forth. Plagary. But mom then every Saturday night we, we didn't get the right kind of food so she'd make us all Take a big ghost cast off. And I, I just hold my nose and scream. I said, Mom, it makes me so sick. She said, if it don't make you sick, it don't do you any good. So, so maybe that'll work this way. Now, how, I'm going to ask you something. Can a man or a woman who claims to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which is the Word? Is that right? And how can you be the flesh of that Holy Spirit has made you part of Him to reflect the gospel of your age and deny the word that He wrote? I don't care how good you are. Well, I can take you to Africa to the, the hot and tops there and show you a life that a Christian can't touch. Even if they be caught in adultery. If one of the women, before she's married, a young woman, she has to be t- tested first for her virginity. If she be found guilty, she has to tell what man did it, and they're both killed together. What if that happened in the United States? Who would bury all the cards? So he, but there you are. See, and they're heathens. See, the morale. See, so you can't test it by that. Our Indian brother here can tell you now the Mohammeds probably have a lot better life than we ever think about. But what is it? It's the Word that gives the test. That Pharisees was twice as humble as Jesus. He went around tearing up their churches and throwing them out and beating them out and everything like that. And this godly old priest, you know. Well, who was? If I was having a meeting against him this morning, I'd say, who come to you when you were sick? Pray for you. That godly old priest. Who loaned Papa that money when his crops failed? That godly old priest. Who dedicated you to God for a life of service? That godly old priest. Who was it when he was in jail come and visit you? That godly old priest. And this young renegade called Jesus. What does he do? Call your pastor a snake. <laughs> See, it's not by the fruits. It's by the word. Man shall not live by fruit alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And he was that word. They just failed to see it. That's what he's supposed to do. They couldn't sit because it wasn't ordained to sit. that you can't come to me. Look at that poor Jews. Their eyes were blinded. Sure, he did it. He blinded himself. Think of how it would be to be blinded. You better be thanking God for what sight you got on the scripture. Now notice. Now he, he was this word. Now after this, uh, he uh, was tested. Jesus tested. Now we're going through this. See, it doesn't reflect the word when anybody says, well, that was for another age. Because the Bible said he's the same yesterday and forever. How the Holy Spirit you could say that you are a filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, can I hurt you a little bit? Is it all right? Raise your hand. You won't be mad at it. If you do, you have to be. How can you win it? With Bob hair, tell me that you're filled with the Holy Ghost. One word. Oh, I spoke in tongues. I don't make any difference. I've seen witch doctors speak in tongues. Interpret that. Shock the spirit, dance the spirit. How can you make call yourself the head of the house? 
and let your wife wear shorts and carry on the way she is. Call yourself Christian. How can you pastors ever face God with a thing like that without standing up and protesting? You can't make them do it. But if you get preaching like that, you won't belong in the seminary very long. Or with the <laughs> You'll have to get cooperation from somewhere else. We'll get into it just in a moment, the Lord will. But there you are. Don't, I don't mean to hurt you. I love you. That's the reason if, if you were floating down the river and I seen you go to drown, I'd be a poor fellow saying, Well, be a good person, honey. <laughs> you better swarm. Run. Tell them. And I said the other night, if I'm a Christian, I have to be identified with every character of the Bible. I had to stand with Lord and preach with him in the day and warn the people. That's right. I had to stand on Mount Carmel alone with Elijah. I had to stand at Calvary and be crucified to myself in my own thoughts with him. But then again, I raised with him on Easter, crying up over all things. All the carnal of the carnality of the world raised above it in him. Notice, it doesn't reflect the word then. No, it doesn't vindicate it. Now, but if you believe the word, God will vindicate himself. As he did here in Jesus. The word bread always means to be fed of And the man shall not live by bread like this bread alone, but by every word. So that's the word bread. Keep that in mind. This is this bread that the church to every age has fed on, has been the hidden manna just for the overcomer only. Revelation said so. Now, I don't have time to break this whole thing down because I've probably got another 30 minutes. But look. When the, holy, when the holy manna fell from heaven, which was a type of the Holy Ghost, you agree on that? God told Moses to go out and get an omer full of it and put it in the holies of holies because if they didn't put it in the holies of holies, it becomes stagnant. Is that right? The worms got into it. Now he said, but put it in the holies of holies in this omer that every generation coming up after that priesthood, when a man becomes to go to the, be a priest, to minister the word, the first thing he gets to do after he's ordained is go in and get a handful of that original man and eat it. That was to represent that light in his hand in the new church age reflecting his life, the man. And only the man that's perfectly overcome, the man that really sets down and throws aside everything else besides the word, and the word is that manna. Oh my it's Jesus. Man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's the hidden manna for the overcomer. Oh, that was laid up each, each, for each priesthood of following it. The schools of theology long ago have swapped this blessed thing for a, a mess of pottage. It's exactly right. Yes, sir. Like Esau did. Now, Esau morally was a better man than Jacob. But he didn't have respect to his birthrights, which was the word. How many know that? His birthrights was the word, the promise, the elder son. But he was a good man, moral man, like the, like the nominal Christian today. A good man. He didn't lie, didn't steal. He was good to his daddy. He'd done all these things. But you see, his birthrights, he said he didn't care about that. What difference does that make? I'm an Israelite anyhow. See, I, I belong to it anyhow. But it was his birthrights that counted. See? His natural was all right, but his spiritual was all wrong. So is it today. The pottage mixed church and world together. Some of each one. Bingo parties, dances, all kinds of carrying on in the church. Short-haired women wearing shorts. We say, Brother Bram, what's that little thing? That's one of the words. Or the Bible said it, it's wrong for a woman to cut her hair. Right. If she does, how is she going to get in? See, and he's preacher tell you the word says that see she dishonors her head she dishonors her husband she should be divorced that's exactly right for she that will cut her hair let her also be shorn off shaven see? if she wants to do that not just Bob God don't want it that way that's that mystery in between don't fool with it either cut her all off or leave it grow that's what God said any minister of the gospel knows that's the truth whether you say it or not but that's the truth See? Oh, what good if you go do all the rest of it and leave that go? What? There's just a little bit of world of style into you, trying to act just a little bit like the other churches. That's exactly where Israel got in trouble. That's where they died. That's where Adam got in trouble. That's where all the rest of them got in trouble. Just one word! That's all it takes, just one point. Pottage mixed with the world. 
Some of the world, some of Hollywood, some of the church, some of the theologians, what you got. Notice, if Satan fails here, then he'll try a second scheme on getting you to, to disbelieve the word and, and go to the seminary and try the next scheme. Now, here's where you want to be real careful. And just set this for another five minutes on this part, if you will. Then, he makes you a supernatural offer. I'm going to come back to all this just before closing. He makes see if he can't get you away from the word. And no, I'm going to stay with the word. Then he'll give you a supernatural offer. He said, I'll tell you what, you get up here and dive off the temple and bring back up. See, show the people that you can do something supernatural. Boy, he got them there. Now watch this. this is, watch when you get to the end where this temptation comes. Maybe he might let somebody be speaking tongues. Think you got it. Or he might even let you prophesy, though it not be with the word. I see people stand up and prophesy with the contrary to the word is the east, is and the west. See? It's the word that you live by. Them supernatural gifts, Satan can just hand them out by handfuls. And certainly, that don't mean one thing. Didn't Jesus say, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, have I prophesied in your name? In your name I've cast out devils. I've done mighty works. I've been a great man in the organization. I've done all these things. These things you say, depart from me, you that work iniquity. What is iniquity? It's something that you know that's right and you can see that you won't do it in your heart. When you know that that Bible teaches a certain thing and you won't do it, that's iniquity. And David said, if I hide iniquity in my heart, God will not even hear my prayer. Is that truth? Is that the Bible? Now surely you couldn't get angry with that. See, Jesus said that many will come to me in that day and say, I've done all these things. And I'll say, depart, you workers of iniquity. Same as did Adam. Adam said, Lord, I did this, I did that. But one word. One word did it. That's all it takes. Just disobey one word. Yes, maybe prophesy contrary to the word. But now, time he's got this supernatural gift, he's so carried away by the noise, by the glamour of it. Glory to God. I prayed for so and so they got up and walked away. Hallelujah. I can speak in tongues and if somebody interpreted it's genuine the truth. Paul said, I can speak in tongues like man and angels and yet be nothing. I can have faith to move mountains and still am nothing. Is that right? But see, he'll offer you that old Pentecostal people. I love you. I wouldn't be with you. There's where you failed. Watch the word. Not the gift. Watch the giver. They work to see where it comes from. He's all carried away. He's dancing in the spirit. Boy, the only thing he's got so many people around him, everybody calling for him here and there, he forgets the word. Oh, you're very popular as long as you stay away from that word. But you get in that word one time, watch, he's going to cooperate with you. Watch what comes out then. We're going to get through this in another stage of nature in a moment. See, watch you, who wants you then? Nobody does. Oh, hands off of that. Like a certain uh, association gathered together here a few weeks ago and banded me. Any minister that comes to the city for the gospel Amen. would have me at the city to pray for their sick would be completely excommunicated from the association. All right, cause a pray for this. All right, don't hear it say, and there's the word vindicated. That's the same thing they've done with our Lord. That's the same thing they've done with every man in every age. That's what they've done with Luther, Wesley, and all that's what they've done with you in the beginning. Now you turn right back to the same water you come out of. Notice, it's always been the same way. It's never failed. Satan does the same thing. Now he's so carried away by the noise of glamour and so forth. That, now he don't even pay attention to the word. Oh, brother, brother so-and-so said so-and-so, and I got to go over here. I right. See, he's just so carried away you don't even notice it. Whether it's word or not word, don't make any difference. The rest of them said it's all right, so it doesn't make any difference. The denomination says, boy, you got it. Don't you let nobody tell you. You got one. Notice, Satan ever had, even then, watching this one place here, he quoted the word. Even on this supernatural, if you try to get Jesus to do the supernatural. See, being had the supernatural, what if Jesus would have listened to him? See? He said, now wait, you want to stay with the word, do you? You want to stay with the word? He said, it's written to give his angels charge concerning this end time, dash your foot against stone to bury the up, but he wasn't dashing his foot against no stone. See? Watch, what if he would have stayed with it? He, you know, I never said he quoted the word, he quoted, quoted it, like putting an icing on a cake, covered it over, whitewashed it. See, it wasn't in its right place. That's what they try to say today, trying to whitewash it. But you can't make it run with the rest of Scripture. It's got to be everything Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. See, no matter how much words you try to quote, that don't matter. It's got to be quoted just the way he said. And if it's quoted right, he'll vindicate it to be so in your life. That's how all men know your written epistles read of God. Written epistles is Bible. 
Is that right? Epistle is the Bible. And your written Bible reflecting his word, that perfect man again in God. But Jesus said, it is written also. But notice, Eve at this same stage carried away by her supernatural understanding. She had a theological experience. Her education was supreme to any theologians in the country at that time. See? She was so carried away she didn't know it. She knew she had something that Adam never had. Perhaps she'd be able to rule over him right now because she knows more about it. Her Adam. Watch what their Adams are doing today. She knew good from evil. Fine education of the truth. That's right. She had a fine education of the truth that she didn't know before and it was God's truth. But she was dead by breaking the word. Amen. She got her education all right. So does the seminary give you a theological experience that you can quote every character in the Old Testament or new. But be careful what you're doing if you don't break that word right there. If you do, they say, well, it's for them. No, it's for you, whosoever will. Amen. Be careful. Well, that was for the church long ago. He's the same yesterday, then, forever. She had a fine education, but she was also dead. In sin and trespass. Now Satan's third scheme. We'll get to it quickly because we don't want to take more time than possible. Maybe another 15, 20 minutes if you want to go that far. No, his third scheme then. It's, or his third temptation. If the others have failed, this one won't. See? He now offers you a position in the church. Like he did Jesus. I'll give you the world. You be the king. I'll make you, they all belong to me, so I'll give it to you. Who can make a man a minister? Who can give a man a gift by laying hands on him? God has said in the church. Amen. See how they twist the word? Like Eve now, with her new knowing knowledge, she had Adam at her sway. She could do what she wanted to. See, as soon as she got Adam to accept it. And but when he comes to Jesus, he didn't accept it. He said, get behind me, Satan. In other words, let me not misquote it, but just add this to it. It's written, every man shall live by every word of God. Not by your proposition. I'll make you the general overseer, a presbyter, or, or deacon, or I'll let you play the piano, sister. Huh? See, all these propositions, you're a very popular person. Huh? We need your talent in our church. See, come to the word. She could rule him or teach him. Same as today's crop. That's the way they do it today. To become a DD, a state president, overseer, district manager, or something like that. How different from Jesus he stayed with the word. Now, in the next few minutes I want to prove all these things true. See, by both nature and word bring it together. This proves he was the word made flesh for bread. He was the word made flesh. For he reflected what? The word only. If you're written epistle, you reflect only the Word. Not what the seminary says, what somebody else says, what Miss Jones thinks about, what Dr. So-and-so thinks about, but what God said about it. Let every man's word be a lie, mine be the truth. Whosoever shall break the least of these commandments and teach man so. Whosoever shall take one word out of this book or add one word to it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word proceeding out of the mouth of God. Live eternally by that word. Just a source. You have to have dead substance there to live by. You have to have Christ to live by here or you die. Amen. And what is Christ? In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word was made flesh and all among us. And you are the same written epistle, one for one age and one for the other for the light of that hour. But they failed to see it. He reflected only. Others fixed all in one, only failed in one point, but he didn't. As I said in Revelation 22, 18, he said, Whosoever shall add to this. Now, watch real close now. Matthew 24, 24 is striking how that the almost in this last day, Jesus said, the very elected would be deceived by the same. Watch the Spirit. In the last days, now that scripture has to be fulfilled. Do you believe it? Now that was in the last days. The very elected predestinated, elected to it, would be deceived so perfectly, it's so scriptural and looks so pretty and clear that you can't see a flaw in it anyhow. Only the elected will escape it. Now that's what Jesus said. Do you believe it? Would deceive the very elected if it were possible. 
Why, it's perfectly scriptures. You can sit in the natural eye, but you see, that isn't it. Jesus and Pharisees had that scripture just as perfect as this could be, but by their own interpretation, how did they know he wasn't wrong? Because God vindicated every word that he promised to him in that age. That's what he was the Messiah. Now notice, if it was possible, in these days, only one word, one word is needed. That's all Satan had to have to add him. Just get him on one word. That's all he has to have today. Just get one thing turned around. That's all. That's all he needs. Now you know that's the truth. To add one or take one is total failure. Every bit, of it, every word of God. Think now of the interpretation of the seminary. Every one different from the other. There has to be a truth somewhere, and this is it. The Bible. Now. Jesus said, you say, well, Brother Branham, they have the most beautiful worship. Jesus said, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the theology of man. Not the word. Man, his own conception of the word being interpreted. As I've said, God don't need no interpreter. He interprets every word himself. See? You don't need somebody to interpret it to you. God interprets it to you when you're willing to accept it. See? That's the life. That's life itself. Jesus said, in vain. They worship me. They actually worship God. Cain actually worshiped God in the beginning. But in vain do they worship me. What's vain? It don't do no good. They might say, well, I do this. I dance in the Spirit. I, I speak in tongues. I, I prophesy. I preach the gospel. But fail. Let your hair grow out. Fail. Well, one thing and see what happens. The Spirit will leave you right there. That's what's happened to our churches. Fail. In vain worship in me. Oh, it's beautiful worship. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of man. Those Pharisees were learned theologians. Don't you dare to say we got anything today to compare with them. No, indeed. They know one word, every word, just the way it was written. But in vain they were worshiping. Think of it, in vain. Big fine schools and seminaries and teachers and young men and everything like that. But lost! Same as the wilderness. He said, they all eat man from that spiritual rock in the wilderness. They all drink from that rock. I mean, and they all eat man out of it. And Jesus said, and they're ever one day. Death means eternally separated. Why? Because they failed to believe the promise of God. Oh, I hate to keep you like this, but it, I just have to say it. Look. I won't take a minute on this. Every one of them people come out under the pillar of fire. They come out in the wilderness, believing God, marched on. But when they come to see the obstacle, when the, when the ten come back and say, we can't take the land. Oh, my, there are giants there. There's this, that, the other. They just, we can't do it. It's impossible. But what did Caleb and Joshua say? They still the people. They said, we were more than able to take it. Wow. Those people were looking what they could see. They're looking at what they can see. But Caleb and Joshua was looking at the promise of God. God said, I have given you that land. Go get it. Now, Hebrews 6, if I could quote it. For it is impossible for them which were once enlightened and have tasted of the Holy Ghost, the power of the world to come, if they shall fall away again. Deny, walk away like those fellows. Come right there and eat the grapes from over on the other land. Stood there. And when it comes to following the word on through, they said, we can't do it. And they died in the wilderness. That's where we got. We tasted the good word of God, but the full promise, no, no, we can't do this. Because Dr. So-and-so or somebody else says we can't do it. That's for the apostles. That's another day. There you die. See, the scripture all ties together. Every word of it ties together. And it cannot be given by any man-made theory system or anything. It's only revealed by the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, Father, I thank you. You hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed it to babes such as the Lord. Amen. Quickly now, let's go to this next thought here, as we can. In vain they worship me. Those Pharisees learned it. Oh, morally good, but called by Jesus devils. Them learned theologians. Jesus said, you're devils. And the works of your father you'll do. He said, you garnish the tombs of the prophets, but your father's back in that same time. Then prophets come forth to tear down those religious systems. That's what they done. Amen. Prophets. Where does the word come? To a theologian or a prophet? Not to the theologians in the school. It comes to a prophet. Amen. Always. God never changes his system. Never. Always has. Always. Not to a group. To an individual. Amen. Never to a group. An individual. Yes, sir. A prophet. And they said, Jesus said, you garnish the tombs of the prophets and your fathers put them in there. Amen. 
Yeah, they're doing the very same thing. Oh, the blindness of Satan's seminary. And now Pentecost, keep your nose out of that world, cancel the churches. Uh, you ministers here, you write into headquarters to, to these people. Now you won't have to write to, to the assemblies and many of them because they done set the thing out. They want nothing to do with it. And you Baptist brethren too, keep your head out of there. Don't you see that's exactly the mark of the beast coming up? You know who's going to gallop it all up if you know anything about the scripture. If the words reflect itself in you, stay away from that thing. Your denomination run into that and you're going to have to do it or excommunicate your denomination. You can't be a denomination to stay there because you've got to come in or stay out. Then you're no more organization. Then you showed yourself. Exactly. God bless you if you do it. Hard to tell how many will do it, but some will, no doubt. Yes, sir. Deceived and Jesus called them devils. Now, but when Jesus is standing there, what? Every temptation. He rebuked it with the word and stood there by the word. God vindicated him. Like or the other night I preached on Michelangelo. How many has ever far so long seen Moses' monument there by Michelangelo? That was a striking. When I went in there the first time and seen it, Michelangelo almost spent his lifetime on making in his mind. He had what, what Moses ought to look like. And he, he wanted to get, get him fixed before he died. And he spent years and years of carving out, chipping off here and breaking off here and polishing here. So finally one day, when he had it finished after many years, he stand there with a rag in his hand like this. He stood back and looked at it. The vision that was in his mind for since he was the first heard of Moses, it ought to look like that. There it was flashed before him. He got so inspired by his own work, he grabbed the hammer, struck it on the leg of horse, speaking Moses. He thought it was Moses should speak. It was so much like the thing that was in his mind. And that mar on the leg is still there. It's a perfect statue all but that chip off of the leg, the right leg. Watch it in far as long as you go in the door. A reproduction of it. Michelangelo's most his masterpiece that's that sealed his life. God's a great sculpture. Right. He made man in his image to reflect him, and he is the word. And what did he do? He tried Adam, he failed. Moses failed. All the rest of them failed. But here's one perfect. Hallelujah. What was it? Nothing less than God himself in flesh. The word reflected in him brought the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Not a prophet, yet he was a prophet. Not a man, yet he was a man. <coughs> Jews, don't try to claim him as yours. He was neither Jew nor Gentile. He was God. See, you are what your blood is. See, and of course your flesh. And Mary, of course, Mary didn't have no conception with the Holy Ghost, uh, giving her a sensation. God the Father created a germ or, or egg in Mary and a blood cell in her also. And it was the blood of God. The blood comes from the male sex. So it wasn't no, the hemoglobin's in the blood. It has to come from the Father. Or the baby can't even take its mother's disease like TB. He can inherit it from the breath of the mother, but not inherit it. He can breathe it and, and catch it, but she cannot uh, take it from the mother because she's free from it. He's not his mother's blood. Now, but Jesus was not the blood of a Jew nor a Gentile. He was a created blood by Jehovah himself. He is the blood of God. The Bible said we're saved by the blood of God. Not the blood of a Jew or the blood of a Gentile. It all be sex, but this is the blood of God. Notice now, when he's seen that perfect one, he struck him, marred him. Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. What was he? He was that perfect word reflected for bread that every man shall live by. He was a queen of God's word that could be grounded and put into four gospels, 66 books, and man shall live by that and that alone and every word of it. Amen. That was Michelangelo's masterpiece. When God could see himself reflected in a man, he had that perfect man created in his own image. Oh, my. What a man. He had to die for all of us. We could stay on that, but we won't. He had to die for all of us. And he died the perfect one that we imperfect could be made perfect in him by partaking of every word of his Bible. Now, then he raised him up again for our justification that we have a right as a raised Jesus that he is here now to minister to us every word of God that we should live by. Now, quickly now, and then we're closing. Now the second E bride. Now the first bridegroom, Adam, had to be brought up to a long string of prophets and so forth. They come out perfect and then had to die in order to be bred for the rest of them. Now, what about Eve? 
She has to do the same thing. But when Jesus comes, remember, Eve was a woman. The church always is, is a woman represented in the Bible because she's bride. Now watch what she did. She tried to persuade him to her doctrine. As long as she had preached just what they thought, he was a great fellow. But one day he began to speak and said, I and the Father are one. <laughs> you make yourself equal with God. See? Oh, my. We won't have to do that for anymore. And all these other things he began to say. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man. What do you think a doctor would have thought sitting in it? What do you think any man would just come and think? If you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. They said, this man's a vampire. Not a minister. Stay away from that man. He's crazy. Stay away from him. But it was the truth. See, it was the truth. Except you eat it, you'll perish. You'll all die if you don't eat it. That's the same thing today. The bread and wine is only a symbol. Don't let that natural thing get you down. You've got to eat Christ, which is the word that you live by. Every word that proceeds, the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Now, the second Eve, watch it. She was created anew like he was at the day of Pentecost, filled with the Spirit and fed by the Word. Amen. Amen. Now I'm getting religious. I feel good. That first church, that first Eve, which was to be Christ's bride. How many can say amen to that? She was to be Christ's bride. She was born at Pentecost. Not in Nicaea, Rome. Not in London, England. Or not in the United States. Not in Germany with Luther. Not in England with Wesley. Not in the United States with Pentecost. So-called. She was born on the day of Pentecost. She was spirit-filled, and she was spirit-filled and word-fed. Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Even the Judas and all they said to take everything just word by word. A real blooming plant on God's earth representing Him. Another bride tree. His word of promise reflected Him in her. They had to take notice to Peter and them. They hadn't been to a seminary. They know that. They hadn't been to any Bible school, some theological seminary. They had no education because they couldn't even write their own name. The Bible said they were ignorant and unlearned. But what happened? They had to take notice. They'd been with Jesus. For there he was in them, reflecting his promise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's what we need. And this age. His word reflected him in her, the church. She was a live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. But then as Eve, she met her fall on the word at Nicaea, Rome, where the first organization was ever organized. The Universal Christian Church. Is there a Bible scholar in here? Is there a, is there a theologian in here that knows that's the truth? The first organization was at Nicaea, Rome. God never did have an organization, never will have one. That's man control. That's where we all... I'm a Christian. What church you belong to? There's only one. I've been a Branham 55 years. I've never joined the family. I was born one. That's how you're born in the kingdom of God, in your reflection of His Word. Notice, Eve met hers, and so did the second Eve met hers at Nicaea, Rome. Gave to it a denomination, creed, accepted dogmas instead of the word, taking down pagan idols like Jupiter and so forth, and put up Paul and Barnabas and, and took down uh, the sun god and the moon god, Estrus, the moon god with round kosher on it, and made her be the mother of the sun god, which is Jupiter, and changed the birthday of Jesus from April, where all nature, where he's born by the ram, because he was a ram. And change that up to the sun God's birthday and the solar there where it makes one day. It's just only about a minute difference in the day when it passes on the 25th day of December. The sun God's birthday, not the son of God. And everyone who has placed Santa Claus and decorate trees of heathenism and things like that. And they call it ourselves Christians. What's the matter with the Christian church? Will there ever rise somebody among us who can preach the word and tell the truth and God vindicated and proved to the people that he's the saint yesterday today? We don't need a seminary. We don't need a theologian. We need a prophet. That's right. God promised the two. Then Eve met her failure. So did the church. Gave away to denominations, rules of man, to be ruled by man. Not controlled by the Spirit no more. She went away from the Word and accepted dogmas. 
Who can say amen? amen. Sure. What do you know? All we Protestants accept as many doctrines as they got. When we add something to this word or take something from it, Satan got her with the same old technique he did Eve. Compromise. That's where he got it. That's something different from the word, a creed or a denomination. The original went on to the ground in martyrdom. The burrs of Rome ground that wheat from Pentecost into the dust and burned them at stakes and fed them to the lines. They went in like the other wheat did. Amen. That's right. But he began to raise her again in the Reformation. The same one, the second time, like he did the second Adam. After Adam fell, he began to raise the second Adam. And the second Adam fell, then was taken up. The first Adam fell in his sin and stayed there. The second Adam fell to redeem a man from sin and was taken up. Now the first church fell at Nicaea, Rome. First, by one word of truth out of the Bible, where the Roman church had added their dogmas and creeds, there come a little priest by the name of Martin Luther who said, this is not the communion, this is not the body of Christ, it's a kosher. And man that just shall live by faith, and he threw the thing on the floor and protested it. There comes your first star shining. After the Thyatira age, yes, sir, justified by faith, he, the great sculpture set up to make a masterpiece bride that would reflect his word. But what did Luther's do after the death of Luther? They met Satan and made a denomination out of it and died. She never done anything else after that. She's done. Just become a great mass of people. All right. Then God picked her up again. In the days of John Wesley, with another truth to reflect. What did he do? He said, sanctification is the second work of grace. And what did God do? He blessed it. And he protested the Anglican church and the Swingley church and all the rest of them. And all the legalists and all the, uh, Calvin, uh, the, the Calvinists, rather, and protested it. And, and said, the just shall live by faith, said Luther. And the second work of grace is sanctification. And that's true. That's right. See? Then what did he do? Same thing after the death of Wesley and Asbury and them. Same thing that Luther did. Organize, die. Look at it now. When it says you're not going to go to pray for a woman in a hospital going on an operation. I went in there. She said, Brother Branham, I called you. You don't know me. She said, but would you pray for me? I've got to have an operation in the morning. I said, certainly, sister. And there's another man, a woman, and a boy sitting there, about an 18-year-old boy. And they was watching me real close. And I turned around. And I said, would you pardon me? I'm going. She said, pull that curtain. I said, aren't you a Christian? She said, we are Methodists. I said, that wasn't what I asked you. I asked you, if you're just Methodist, I'll pull the curtain. If you're a Christian, you don't want the curtain pulled. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. So there's a lot of difference being a Methodist or a Baptist or Presbyterian than being a Christian. Not being a Camelite, but being a Christian. What should you do? The same thing. Then what happened? God picked up a little bunch down here in the south, a little colored man with a cross eye. And he, what did he do? He poured out the restoration of the gifts. And it became Pentecost. Many of you old timers like Brother Valdez sitting back there, age, sage, was preaching when I was five years old. He remembers the early Pentecost. Boy, don't you speak organization of them guys. <laughs> they come out of that nasty thing. And they had the message of God. But what did they do? Same thing the others did. Organized it. Now they've got about 30 or 40 different organizations. One is two and is three, so mercy goodness. I never heard such in my life. What did you do? You died right on the spot. That's all the farther you could go. Your organization wouldn't accept this. You, you picked your man, this man, if you don't believe with us, don't have him in there. Our fellowship won't have it. Oh. But look, hurry. There must come a true seed. There just got to be because he's coming for the bride without spot or wrinkle. He's coming for him. A word vindicated bride. Oh, she'll be such a little bitty group. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, wherein eight souls were saved. Is that right? Amen. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. How many? I don't know. But see, the bride's going to be made up of all down through it had the word. And their age. It's not just this last group. God's going to take the whole thing out of here. Hold on, no. It'll be, it'll be so small, it'll be surprising. They'll come up missing, you won't even know they're gone. What if you took 500 in this last day? You'd never know it. Took 500 in a few days, time, two, three days. There's that many people comes up missing across the world. Don't even know where they're at. Never hear nothing about them. 
the secret coming of the Lord Jesus should be taken away. And the rest of them go right ahead preaching just like it was in the days of Noah. Glory to God, we got it, hallelujah, and steal to their death. That's what the Bible says. And it can't fail. As Noah, Moses, David reflected the coming of this perfect bridegroom, so has Luther, Wesley, and Pentecost reflected the coming of a perfect bride. Notice, each time she indicated, what did she do? She, each time this church, like Eve did, she forced her Adams to believe her new life, her scheme. And there died with it. We'll, our group will get together, see? Oh, our new blessings are what we found so far. What did this all do to Eve? We just got a short time now. What did this all do to Eve by the first mother church, the first bride to the first Adam? What did it do to her? Now listen close, you're going to disagree with this. But it produced the seed of the servant. Exactly. Her first son was not the son of Adam. If it was, he had the birthrights. The Bible in Jude said that Adam at the Enoch was the seventh from Adam. Is that right? And he starts out, Adam begot his son, Seth. What about Cain, which had the birthright? Wasn't Adam's son. Seth and Seth begot Jared and on down to Adam, which was, on down to, which was the seventh from Adam. Then if Cain was his son, there's not one place in the Bible, even in Luke, when he refers back to it again, he never refers to Cain being the son of Adam. If he wasn't, whose son was he? If he was the son of Adam, he was his first son, which had all the birthrights. Oh, there's that church carnal. Can't you see it? That accepted something but the adultery instead of the word? Pentecostal people. Bless you. All right. What did it produce to Eve? The seed of the serpent. What has it done in this last day's by denomination? Produce the seed of the serpent again. Rejecting the word. What do you offer? Fruits and things, not the blood. Oh, by revelation of the word, God's word, before it's even written, Abel, by faith, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than that of King, which testified that he was righteous. The word reflected itself to him by his offering. Oh, King went and got fruits of the field. He thought that Eve eat an apple. Most of the theological seminaries have changed that now to an apricot. It was an adultery, and anybody knows that knows the Bible. Sure, uh, notice, the serpent seed was produced by the first Eve getting away from the Word. The second Eve done the same thing at Nicaea, Rome. And what has she got? A bunch of denominational children. That's right. Oh, morally good, sure, fine. But what about it? Dead to their creed. Same now. Cain's revelation of the Word done the same thing that these had. What promised her at the end of time? What promise is this Eve now? Listen close now, I'm close. What promise to this Eve at the end time? Riches. Lady of Sia. Great name, great person, rich, but dead and naked and don't know it. That's what the church age ended in. But she denies the Word. To make Matthew 24, 24 real to her, she tries to move in with a lot of noise, a lot of this, and a lot of social standings and things like this, trying to say, well, we got power. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We got power. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, so close that would deceive the very elected. How can a man dance in the spirit and speak in tongues and deny the word of God being the truth? it be the Holy Ghost. It just can't be done. Every word. God says one thing, that's just exactly what he means. Don't interpret it no other way. The Bible says that it's of no private interpretation. Say it the way he said it. Notice, a false power. That's exactly what Satan wanted to give to Jesus. Get up there and make him show himself off. People do that. Even the world council, all of them. Who is able to make war with him, said the Bible. This image of the beast is going to rise. We had time, we go in, but we had to it. Notice, Jesus, the second word, Adam... In her days, watch in the days of this church now, that's going to be so close, the last church age is Lady of Sia. How many can say amen to that? What does she do? How does she go on a glorious stage? Lukewarm. Without God. And what did she do? Now Adam seen Eve willfully, or not willfully, but eagerly deceived. And Adam walked out with Eve so he could redeem her. Is that right? The Bible said Adam wasn't deceived. That's the reason it forbids women to preach the gospel. See, Adam was not in the transgression, and Eve was. 
So she, that's the reason she shouldn't teach the, or serve any authority over man or so forth. That's, that's what the Word says. You say, well, this, I don't care what this does and that does. It's what the Word says, brother and sister. I'm trying to get that to you. See, it's what the Word says. We live by the Word, not what some evidence or some carnal something or some experience. I don't have one thing to do with it. Any kind of an experience won't work if it denies the Word. Many will come in and say, I've prophesied, cast out devils, I've spoken tongues, I've done all these things, preach the gospel, I've got the divinity. He said, you worker of iniquity, I didn't even know you. Amen. Knowing that the word says that may compromise the cause of some organization or something, some system. Oh, my friend, let me warn you as a dear brother that loves you. Listen closely. Now, the first Adam walked out with Eve because she was deceived. But there's been somebody here to this lady, Zia. She no different. Yes, sir. Because she put him out of her bed, her room. She was on the outside knocking, trying to get back in. Yes, she had got culture. She was high. She was, oh, my, had need of nothing, she said, but didn't know that she was naked, miserable. That's the church that deceives a very elected if it was possible. Notice, she had power, false power. She took power of the word, didn't take the rest of it. What is the biggest lie that was ever told? It's got 99% truth in it. And somebody said, William Branham, on this certain date, was up out in Houston, Texas, drunk as he could be. <laughs> That's a lie. Well, I said, no, he was in Phoenix, Arizona. He was preaching to a Christian business, and he preached on a certain subject. So many people there. They listened to uh, about 1030. And at 1030, you know what he done? Reached out and got a drink of liquor and took it. Now, there's a lie. The rest of it is all true. See, it has to look just exactly like the truth to be deceiving. That's how the people does today. They have so much of the truth to deceive the very elected, but one word. That's all it takes. And I've proved that by the Bible. Notice, he never walked out with her. She cut him out. The Word rejected him. Now, this is a pitiful sight when we get to the end. Just like it was in Babylon, man won't stop that anything he's trying to achieve himself. He just won't stop. Like in the days of Noah, no matter how much Noah preached and mourned, didn't do a bit of good. In the days uh, when Ahab, he must make his own bread to send his own self to hell. That's exactly. He has to make his bread so the link will break. So it'll send his own self to hell. Just like Ahab and Jezebel. They, but the thing of it is, they didn't think they were sinning. They thought they were doing right. You know, Jesus said, it'll come to pass that they'll even kill you thinking they're doing God a service. Wait till this new book of mine comes out. They shot at some people the other night for saying that it was wrong to unite the Roman Catholic Church with the Protestant. Three shots went through a building of a friend and I just barely missed them. Wait till this book gets in circulation. Don't think they're sinning. They think they're doing the right thing. They think they're, they're doing that for a cause for God, not knowing it. The Jews killed Jesus thinking they were doing the right thing because their church doctrine said he was wrong. Oh. Said for them... He they crucified the very bread that they were supposed to live by. Now, then, as many as receive him to be their life, eternal life, they live by him, and he gave them power to become part of him, sons of God. Is that right? They like the wild gourds, death in the pottage, from the school of their theologians. They don't want Jesus, the bread of life. They don't want him. They put him out of the church. They've got to do it. I don't care what they do. Uh, you say you think you're going to change it, Brother Bram? No, sir. But I'm speaking to the elected. Amen. They put him out. Why? They took their pottage mixed with the world, some theories of something, and mixed it together and made a theological seminary pottage, and they refused the prophet Elijah's meal to cure it. Amen. Did they do it that day? Amen. Elijah had some meal. That meal was at Christ, the meal offering, all ground the same. Every burr had to be the same to grind it. And he threw that in there, and it cured their sickness, or their death in the pot. But today they got death in the pot, and they don't want Elijah's meal, Christ, the bread, the word. No, sir, it's for heresy. They won't have it. Go ahead and eat it. You'll die as sure as the world. There's poison in the pot. They won't accept this in the evil. No, sir, in their theological pots, they just won't do it. Now, they'll put you out of it. They don't want nothing to do with it. Now, the second Eve bread grain was Pentecost, did as the first Adam bread, went to death under the Roman burrs, under persecution, martyrdom, but her sister, which became a whore. Is that what the Bible says? Right. What did she do? She went right on out into the world and begot children. 
Who can say amen to that? Revelation 17, the whore and her daughters, not men, women, churches, the denominated, what made her a whore? She rejected the word and took the denomination. She became a whore. What did her children do? They were harlots, which is the same thing. Done the same thing, rejected the word and took to the denomination. Her children, daughters, churches. Look at them. Now let me say this in prophecy. Will you understand? The big family fuss is about over. They're all coming back together. Old mother's going to take her kids back again. They're all the same anyhow. They want to be one. It's time for the church and God, church and word to get one right here because that's what's coming at you. Not a one group like that. No, sir. A grain of wheat is to be. Now, watch nature. And we're closing on this stuff. Watch nature. A man plants wheat. They wrote a book. I guess you all read it. Probably some of you theologians. Called The Silent God. I think you can get it maybe in, in your books. In your uh, Where you sell books. Bookstores. The Silent God. Said how, uh, infidel, said how could you ever expect to be a God that could sit up there during the dark ages and watch little children be put to death by fire. Women, their long hair stuck down in pitch and burn. Put an ox on one arm and one or another and pull them apart because you won't kiss a crucifix. And all those things like that. But how could a God, if there was one, sit up there and watch those little children burn? See, that's a natural carnal mind. See? Look, do you know a wheat, when it goes into the ground, it's got to lay there and rot? That's what that Pentecostal church had to do. Lay there and go to the ground and die. It had to rot in order to bring forth life again. Is that right? Now watch. Now this is my closing thoughts. Now to wind it all up, let's take nature. How many believe that God works parallel in nature to all things? Look, He done the world. He redeems the world the same way He redeems the man. What does a man believe? He believes. Then he's baptized. Then he's cleansed by the blood. Sanctification, which is Wesley's message. Then he's filled with the Holy Ghost fire, takes the world out of him, and he's filled with the Spirit, which is the Word. Do you believe that? I watch what God's going to redeem his world the same way. How many got the, the, the future home of the bride and groom on the table? See, I brought it out of that. The Lord gave it to me. I give it on to you as he gives it to me. Look, the first thing the world was condemned under Adam's fall from the Word. The preaching of Noah brought justification and God baptized the earth with water. Then along came the Son and dropped His blood upon it to sanctify it, to claim it for His own. Then in the final wind-up, the renovation will be fire that will burn every germ, everything. It will go for thousands of miles high in the air. And then what? I saw a new heaven, a new earth. First heaven and earth was passed away, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending from God out of heaven, adored as a bride for her, uh, adored as a bride for her husband. See, coming down upon the earth. Then God and man, same thing with Jesus. Look, when he is baptized in water, made his preparations, he was sanctified to begin with by the Father. Then he raised up his hands, and here come the dove upon the Lamb. What was God doing? When he put the dove on there, he cleaned that part of life. That, that part of the earth. Jesus to eat food like we had, the natural bread. But now God cleans it. There ain't nothing going to hold it. Death can't hold it. Say, destroy this temple, I'll raise it up again. And when the man and woman goes into God, completely not under some spell, not under some emotion, but really when the word in him becomes one, God has saved that person, sanctified him from the things of the world, renovated everything of the world away from him with the fire of the Holy Ghost, and lives in that person, reflecting himself, that perfect man and woman living by the Word. Amen. That's the earth is clean. He views the earth the same way. He redeems it. Now why? A corn of wheat falls into the ground. Now, Jesus is that corn of wheat that fell into the ground, which after is made perfect. It had life in it. Moses didn't raise it. Adam didn't raise. No, the rest of them raised. But this perfect one that reflected the word in every life, every word he lived by. How many can say amen to that? Amen. Every word he lived by. What happened? They cut him in the grave, but three days he broke her open and come out again. See? Now here comes the church again. See? Coming to that perfect one for the rapture again. Now what happened? After the church fell in the ground and nicely alone to the first organization, can anybody say amen to that right? Amen. What did she do? She come out again in a temporary resurrection. He tried to Luther as same as he did through Noah. But what did he do? He failed the word. He organized. What did he do? It's like a grain of wheat coming up. 
When the grain comes up, what's the first thing comes up? Two little sprouts. Well, this is real close. What comes up? Natural. Now we're going to follow the natural with the spiritual. Natural bread with the spiritual bread. What happened? How could this man be bread? Watch. When the church came up, she's one little leaf. Now that don't look like the grain that went in the ground at all. But it's a carrier of the life. See? Now what happens? Now the man says, oh, I got a good field of wheat. No, he potentially he has. What happened? The next come up was Swingley. That was another movie come up after Luther. Still, that wasn't it. It's a blade. Then the stove put forth many blades, such as Calvin and so forth come up. Finally, the Anglican church raised up. All blades. See, all of it just exactly like the same thing. Then what happened? The wheat changes and the corn changes and everything changes. What comes was a tassel. Amen. You might call it tassel. Amen. Well, when it did, look what hangs on it. Little pollens. Now, that looks just a little bit more like the original grain that went in than the blade did. Is that right? Well, Wesley's message was closer to the Bible than Luther's. You know that. Is that right? What are all them little tassels now? There was the Wesleyan Methodist, Nazarene, Pilgrim Holiness, United Brethren, all those under sanctification. And what come from that then? It finally, what did it do? Organize. Die. What come out of that? Was the Pentecostals. You say, oh, brother. Now, reverend, I say this with godly love. And may the great Father, who I just told you in the beginning, was present here. Omnipresent. If I say this through prejudice, then he'll judge me. If I say it through truth, he'll bless me. He'll let you see it if you're ordained to life. When the first little grain of wheat comes out on the stalk of a wheat, it absolutely looks like the grain. Is that right? Amen. But what is it? It isn't the grain. That's at Matthew 24, 24. So close that would deceive the very elected if possible. Amen. Notice. It looks just like the green. But you pull that off and sit down and take a microscope glass and begin to pull it back. It's just the shuck Amen. on the corn, the shuck on the wheat. It's only did to protect it, but it looks just exactly like the green. Now, how many knows that to be truth? Raise your hand. Sure. But it's a shuck. Now, Pentecostal brethren, don't get me wrong, but this is truth. You can't defy nature. And nature declares God in everything. It's created. Now look at that shell. It looks, what they do, they spoke in tongues, they act exactly like they did in Pentecost. But if you cut that, take that little thing and pull it back, it's got many little shucks in it. And when you pull it back, you see way back at the back of it, you'll have to have a good glass. Look back there, there's a little teeny bud of a grain coming on. There's the real thing. It's a carrier. Well, now, it has to be there to protect that grain. It's working in harmony. But it's to protect that grain. Now, where the grain come from the ground, up through the Luthers, through them churches, through West End, through there, out through the tossels, and now down into the shelf. Now, it looks just perfectly. No wonder Jesus said it to see the very elected, if it was possible. It looks just like the grain, right in the place the grain ought to be. But what happened? It did the same thing that the others did before, organized. What did it become? A carrier. Now, in the days that we're living, any historian here knows that any revival only lasts about three years. And then out of that revival comes an organization. Brother, sister, in this great 15-year revival that I have lived in, been privileged to live it with you, there hasn't been an organization come out of it. There's no more organizations. They won't be. There's the last. Now, Pentecost had to be there to protect this. Where would we have went with a message like this if they hadn't been a Pentecostal to believe it? Now go back to the Ohio River in 1933. Excuse us, but I want you to know the truth. And I haven't got much time left, you know that, I'm 55. But these tapes will live when I'm gone. And you'll see whether it's right or not. If I be a true servant or a false prophet. I've never told you nothing yet but what happened. So will this happen. It's a carrier. It had to be. But when that wheat begins to grow, like the church first was a carrier to Jesus. But when he began to tell them the truth of God, they separated from him. Now what's happening? No cooperation. 
Why, it has to be that way. So that the wheat itself can lay before the sun, S-U-N. And so the spiritual wheat can lay before the S-O-N. To be turned to a golden grain of the Word. Made Word God, made flesh, vindicated the He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall be on the church that lives for that word, rightening, not through organization, but in presence of the word. The Son, it becomes what? A very same word that went down on the day of Pentecost. Now, does the Malachi 4 teach us that before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come, that this will take place? How many knows that? And he will restore the hearts of the children to the fathers. Is that right? The faith of the original Pentecostal fathers. And in that day, Luke 17, 20, I believe it is, Jesus said, when the Son of Man is being revealed, not man, the Son of Man, not an organization, the Son of Man, the Word living itself again among the people. See? The Word itself made flesh in you. You are a reflection of this hour, the message, reflection of it. See? You live again. Live the life that was in Jesus Christ. You're in the presence of the Son. Then to the, what happens to it? What happens to that church? Finally, listen, that shuck pulls away from that wheat when it begins to be manifested. Amen. What happened? The life that was in the shuck went on out in the wheat. Amen. The life won't change. The carriers change. Amen. They denominate. See, the blades, the tossel, the shuck. But the wheat can't change. It's got to be a ministry just exactly on the Word like He was on the Word like the first church was on the Word. Spirit-filled, Word-fed. Not denominational-fed, Word-fed. Now there's nature and the Word of God. He is that bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Closing now before prayer. Notice here. Here comes the thing I want to say. Now that shuck has to pull away from that wheat. That's in God's providence. How many says amen? amen. The shuck has to pull away from the wheat because it's maturing. It's up. Now that shuck wasn't there. It was a supporter. It was a carrier of the life. Then the life out of there went right out into the wheat. Now that's the reason. Listen, friends. What day are we living in? We've had a 15-year revival. How many can say amen to that? What organization raised up? None. They tried to get me to make an organization. Said, well, you make organization, Brother Bram, on your ministry. It'll be, now not me, I ain't talking about me, I'm talking about the message of the hour, the day. And they went up there in Canada and got a few latter rain brethren. It died right there. Remember the latter rain, you brothers? Where did it go to? Where did anything else go to? But what did the organization get out of it? Millions of converts and made slaves out of them to their creeds. Become rich and building millions and billions of dollars in buildings and things like that and saying, the Lord is coming. Sending preachers to seminaries and things and educating them on man-made theology like Luther, Wesley, and the rest of it. It become a shuck. But thank God the grain's going on. Then if that is true by the Word where we're living, that is true by nature. It's vindicated. The corn of wheat every week. How much longer we got? You know what? I hear the coming of the Combine, the World Council. She'll separate it. What does she do? Shake her off of her stuff. But she's got an elevator waiting for her. She'll go home one of these mornings. Oh, yes. You understand? Say amen. amen. I know the world don't believe that. They can't believe it. Don't just feel sorry for her. Because no man can come set my father draws him. And all my father has given me will come. If his name is on the book of life, he'll certainly recognize the word. He's got to. It's done too long. He's done vindicated so perfectly to his positive the truth. We won't have any more organizations. But all the organizations are going to one. What's she going for? Going for what do they do with the straw? Burn it. Jesus said the angels will come. Gather the wheat into the garner. And what will take place? The stalks and stubbles and Briars will be burnt with unquenchable fire. You see, and what that has to be done first? The angels went forth and bound the terriers first. Is that right? Amen. See, they bind themselves together in one great big organization. No more organizations. The wheat's here. Amen. 
feet are drawn. The wheat is here. Christ is here. He proves his word it's the truth. The wheat is here. It's maturing now. It's laying in the presence of the sun. Not any man may touch it. It's all pulling away. We'll have nothing to do with it. You have to do that. Oh, brother, get in the wheat. Let your life and sin you come out into the wheat, will you? Believe God. Don't just stay with God. Are you sure you're going to make it? What if somebody said, I don't care. Like a story I read one time. There was a doctor. He was a fine man. And he loved poor people. And every time the poor couldn't pay their debts, you know what he done? He just signed it in red ink and said, you're forgiven. Finally, the doctor died. And when the doctor died, his wife was eerie. She was different. Like the church today. She went and ground them all together. She brought lawsuit and threw them all in the court. You're going to pay these bills anyhow. But the judge picked up some of the receipts. He said, come here, madam. He said, is this red ink your husband's signature? She said, yes, sir, it is to be in a court in the land. They are free. Let them say what they want to. He signed his word with his own blood. Ain't nothing can take it away from us, brother. We are free. Let us pray. Sure. Oh, the people I stand to be, how long let him unto thee, time upon time, and I stand to thee, I do not send my prophets in time of peace, but I send them in time of trouble, the end they may turn to my people back unto me, oh my people, how long will you say amen, how long There's one place to meet your enemy. That's at the Word. That's where He's trying to meet you. You meet Him there with, Thus saith the Lord. How many in here with your heads bowed? It's so close to noon, I haven't time for an altar call, but just this. Would raise your hands with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. I want to be a part of Him. I want to join myself with Him and His Word. No matter what comes or goes, what the world says, I want to be part of Him. Raise your hands. I do. God bless you. 100% of me. With our heads bowed while we're thinking, let's quietly hum this little song out. Everyone pray. Blessed be the time that binds, that's the word, our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kinder Father one, you are one with him too. When we asunder part, it gives us in word pain. But we shall still be joined in heart and hope to be again. Next Saturday morning at Blackstaff, Arizona, the Lord willing, I hope to meet with you again. Do you love him? Now I'm just going to leave it like that. See? The Bible said, as many as believe him, and as many as receive the word. See, I can't say who is or who isn't. That's up to you. But if you're holding on to some little creed, some of you Baptists, Baptists or Pentecostals or whoever you may be, that's holding on to something contrary to that word, please, my dear people, Turn from it today, won't you? Turn from it and turn to Him. Don't let one word ever break you from the fellowship of Christ. May His Spirit grant it. Father God, these people have sat here for a long time. It reminds me of one time that Paul, preaching on this same line, it was a gospel. They sat all night long and listened to him. A young man fell from the window and was killed. 
Paul went and laid his body up over the young man and said, Life has come back to me. Now, Father, there's sick and afflicted here. There are those who need prayer for their bodies. I pray, dear God, not to wait for the meeting. They don't have to wait for anything. The Word is always here. That's Christ. I pray that you'll heal every one of them. Let every one of them be made completely whole, God. Granted, bless them. Their efforts, they wouldn't have said, Your Lord, they wouldn't have listened to this if they hadn't believed it. Now, Lord, they raise their hands, they believe it. Now, may it receive into their hearts every minister, ever one of the laity, the sinner, may he receive Christ, the backslider, come back. Granted, Father, these blessings we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I love him. I love him. Be put my name in there many years ago. First love me and first just my Now, while we sing that again, just reach across the table and shake hands with somebody. Say, dear pilgrim, I'm glad to say to you this morning, I believe Christ, don't you? Something like that. When we sing again, fashions of the world and the, all the nonsense and all this your glamour and taking the gospel and making a commercial thing out of it and, and are we true with it don't we just give me jesus that's all i want to know him is life knowing i love him don't you love him oh how we love him now i'm going to turn the service to brother carl i don't know what else he's going to do god bless you and I hope to see you again next Sunday. And if I can't see you, or next Saturday, if I don't see you then, see you down Tucson. If not then, I'll see you back here the 17th. If not then, I'll see you in glory. Amen. Brother Carl, now I don't know what he wants to do right at this time. Brother Williams.